If you are considering transitioning careers to become a software developer, watch this course. This course is designed to prevent the common mistakes and missteps that discourage many beginners. It offers clarity, tools, and strategies to efficiently achieve your coding goals, whether that's securing a high-paying job, launching a tech startup, or just exploring the world of software development. Zubin Pratab was a lawyer and transitioned to becoming a Google engineer. Now he helps others with their career transitions. Hi guys, welcome. My name is Zubin Pratap. I'm a software engineer and a DevRel engineer and currently at Chainlink Labs. Before this, I was at Google as an engineer. And before that, I was a corporate lawyer for over 15 years and I went into executive management for a while, had my own startup for a while. That's kind of how I learned to code. And this little mini course that I'm releasing for you guys through Free Code Camp now is an updated version of the original course that I released three years ago. Um, maybe four years ago actually now where I when I finally succeeded in my career transition from lawyer I was 38 or 39 at the time and I'd become a software engineer and I you know got the offers that I'd applied for I was you know top of the world and I'd promised to Quincy the founder of uh, Free Code Camp in a podcast with him right after I'd completed my career transition that I was going to make this course that documented everything that I'd wish I'd known like three or four years before because I'd really struggled for three or four years trying this thing, trying that thing. You know, I was in my 30s. There was a lot of sacrifice and risk involved, a lot of fear. And so I tried all sorts of things to to, to, to make the transition. And I kept failing. I learned all sorts, tried to learn all sorts of tools and languages. And I, I didn't realize that there's a big difference between learning how to code and actually becoming a professional software engineer. Massive difference. And I didn't appreciate that back then. So I, it, it cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars and, you know, in lost income and, and all kinds of things and, and four plus years of real struggle and self-doubt and, you know, just damaging my confidence and having to rebuild it. So I promised Quincy back then um, during the podcast that, you know, I'm going to do this course. And so I, I did release it. And now this is the updated version. This is the history of the course. So this course is really... I, I call it, you know, everything you need to know before you learn to code, because it's not about the actual coding itself. It's about all the things you need to know to build the right plan, to set the right expectations, and to know how to put yourself through the process of transitioning from being a non-technical person to a professional level software engineer, right? So it's how do you build a plan? How do you uh, become the sort of person you need to be? What habits and practices and expectations do you need to have? So that's really, so I call this the, you know, before you learn to code everything you need to know course. Now, a couple of things, just to be very clear, this is not really probably well suited for people who are just students who've never actually had a career before. And the reason I'm saying that is I finished law school in 2003, right? So that's 20 years ago. I, I've lost touch with what it's like to be a university student these these days and, and approach the job market from that perspective. This is very much a course for people who are in busy careers already, even if they're in IT, but non-technical, non-coding sort of careers or any other career. Like I've, I've coached people around the world now, you know, lawyers, therapists, you know, theater personalities, all sorts of people, security cybersecurity folks I've coached them all you know on this process of career change and becoming a professional coder so this is for people who have existing careers who are looking to switch careers who want to acquire advanced like you know professional level coding skills and become professional coders whether it's data science data analysis software engineering they're not you know you could argue whether or not they're coding but I'm trying to include anything that involves scripting or software engineering in this right so this is for that kind of person uh, I am not an expert for, for students I'm sorry but I'm, I'm not anymore I'd, I'd be lying if I said I was it's been too long uh, I've lost that perspective right but I am very much I consider myself to be an expert in career change because I've done it myself three careers in four countries and most recently to software engineering in my late, late 30s, you know, even ending up at places like Chainlink where I am now and software engineering, um, you know, at, at, uh, at Google before that, right? So this is really important for you guys to understand before you go. Now, I had no way of knowing how long this entire journey was going to take me when I was trying to transition. And, you know, because I, I tried and failed, like I said, four times before, all the way through my mid 30s, I tried every year, I tried a different thing for several months, and quit and fail. And so that's what I'm, I'm trying to achieve here is to save you four years if I can or more right and and help you understand what the process is going to look like so that's a bit of an introduction about me this is going to help you understand what to expect from this course it's not going to be about hands-on coding it's meant for those of you who haven't started learning to code yet or maybe you've been trying for three or four or five months finding it frustrating not sure what to expect watch this course it's not that long and see just all the tools and techniques that I had to develop over those four years. This course really represents my diary entries for all those four years, all the things I did wrong. I'm sort of re repurposing that into actionable items that you can use. So that's a bit of an introduction, and I hope you get a lot of value out of this course. And if there's any way I can help you, reach out on LinkedIn or, or Twitter or whatever. I'll see you in another video. 
Welcome to this course on Before You Learn to Code. All the important things you need to know to avoid failure and discouragement on your journey to code. If you're here, it means that you're either interested in starting to learn to code or you've just started and are a code newbie. Either way, it's super exciting and I'm glad you're here. I can't wait to share some of the learnings that I've had with you. And so let's just get into it. Now you can get a sense of this course from the website matchfitmastery.com but I'm also going to take you through a high level introduction of the course right now. So what is this course? I have designed this course for people like you, people who have either just started or are seriously thinking of learning to code. And this course teaches you all the skills that you need to learn to code, but it does not teach you to actually code. That's a separate topic altogether. Now most people just dive right into coding, right into trying to teach themselves code, without first adequately preparing themselves. It's like running a marathon but with zero training. It, it just doesn't work. Because then when you fail or you feel overwhelmed by the situation, you just assume that you can't learn to code. And I know this from personal experience because that is exactly what I did. Not once, but twice. Twice I tried to teach myself to code by just throwing myself into it without a proper plan. And both times I failed. So what did I do right the third time around? Well, that's exactly what this whole course is going to be about. So the first time you go through this, though, I do recommend you do it end to end. Even though I've designed it as a hop on, hop off experience where you can dip in and dip out, I really recommend that the first time you go through the entire thing, even if you do it at 1.5 speed, just go through the whole thing because that'll give you a sense of what to expect, not just from the course, but also from coding generally. So who is this course for then? Well, it's for anyone who wants to know what it means to learn to code and how to build an effective learning plan around that and what to expect along the way. It doesn't matter whether you've got any coding experience. It doesn't even matter whether you've seen a line of code. Not necessary. All that matters is that you're thinking about it or you've just started or have tried before and have failed. If you want to ensure that you save time and effort and money on your journey, then this is really the course for you. That's why I made it. Because when you buy it, you get lifelong access, which is fantastic because I will keep updating it from time to time with new tips and techniques that will save you even more time, money, and energy. Now, I know I talk about these three things, these three very important resources being money, time, and energy. But in my view, the most valuable of these three resources is your time. Because money and energy sort of comes back. You can go up and down, but time, you just can't recover it. Lost time is lost time. And so a lot of the focus on, in this course is really on saving you time. And through that, of course, you're going to end up saving effort and very likely money as well. I personally wasted more than eight months of my life and over $1,100 teaching myself to code in very ineffective ways. But 90% of my learning ended up coming in less than six months and for less than $200. It's that kind of learning and optimization that I want to share with you in this course. But it begs the question, who am I? And why should you bother listening to what I'm saying? Well, a little bit of background in me I am a lifelong learner. I qualified as a lawyer many, many years ago, and I practiced corporate law for over a decade in three countries. I then changed careers, did an MBA, went to the management track. Along the way, I taught myself product management skills. I taught myself how to play the guitar. I taught myself how to code. And so I've evolved over that period certain habits and techniques to learning and optimizing the learning that anyone has to go through when they acquire a new skill. And I realized that my entire process was so inefficient and so slow. And most people still do the same things. It's, it's not an efficient process. But this course will give you some efficient techniques or rather techniques that will make it a lot more efficient for you. So what I did in a year, you could legitimately expect to do in much, much less time and probably much less wasted effort. As you progress through this short course, I hope you're going to want to ask a lot of questions and clarify some things. I think that's a fantastic way to learn and consolidate your learning. But I encourage you to do that and I encourage you to use the Q&A forum if available because that way other people can learn from you and participate in your learning journey. 
If that is unavailable for whatever reason, or you feel you need to reach out to me in another format, I'm always available on Twitter as well, and sometimes on LinkedIn, though I'm a little less responsive on LinkedIn for a number of reasons. But Twitter is great. Feel free to reach out anytime, and I will do my best to help you. So now that we've covered how to reach me, who I am, what this course is about, and who it's for, I'm getting really excited. I'm... Um, I'm really excited for you and I can't wait to jump into this journey with you. So let's just dive right in. In the next section, we're going to talk through the goals that I have for you and for myself in this course. So I'll see you there. Okay, welcome back to this section. In this section, I'm going to take you through the main course goals that I have. I have two categories of goals that I wanted to achieve. Um, my personal goals in making this course and my goals for you. Within the category of my personal goals for this course, number one, I want you to feel and know at the end of it that you've made a good investment in getting this course. Number two, I want to save you a lot of time, money and effort. And three, I want to give you the self-confidence to pursue your learning objectives. Now let's talk about my goals for you. This course is really about you. I haven't lost sight of that. And it's about giving you the best knowledge and tools to achieve your learning objectives. So it's about making sure that at the end of the course, you have these things. One, you are equipped to save a lot of time, money, and effort. Two, you are crystal clear on the following. Your coding goals, your coding plan or path to achieve these goals, the steps, routines, habits, and timelines required to achieve your goals. Pay careful attention to those specific choice of words because they're all very deliberate. The fourth goal I have for you is that I want to ensure that you can recognize myths or mismatched expectations that stand in the way of your learning to program. Fifth goal, I want you to be able to use effective tools and strategies that make your coding journey enjoyable, positive, and as discouragement-free as possible. Because believe me, there's a lot of discouragement that you will encounter. I want to minimize that. Goal six for you is that I want you to be able to recognize the pitfalls and diversions that you will inevitably encounter so that you can make decisions that help you achieve your goals rather than delay you or derail you. The seventh goal is that you can proceed with confidence, resilience, and clarity and be a highly effective lifelong learner. And that's something I'd like to emphasize here, that the skills and the abilities um, that I'll be talking about over the course of this um, program are really to equip you to be a lifelong learner. While it's wrapped around a concept of learning to program computers, almost everything you learn in this program is about lifelong learning and the ability to keep learning as you proceed through life. Now, I am convinced that you can do all of these and more. Everybody can. It is not easy, but it's not impossible. In fact, it's totally achievable for everybody. So if you've come this far, I'm absolutely 100% convinced that you've got the willpower, you've got the hunger, you've got the drive to do it. So don't stop. Don't ever stop. Okay, now that we've established our course goals, let's talk about how you can get the most out of this course. The suggestions that I'm going to put forward here are based on largely my personal experience, but also the experience of all the super learners around me that I've read about or met personally. This is something I've studied and researched extensively, and it really does boil down to two things, preparation and mindset or you could call it mentality or something else. But preparation and mindset are the two basic keys to your learning objectives. So now sharing these with you is really the first step in helping you achieve your goals. And I know it might sound a little bit like I'm preaching or something, um, and I apologize for that, but this is just so fundamental that your success in all the sections from here onwards starts with you getting good at this preparation and mindset. So, to get the most out of this course, I recommend you practice the following mindsets. Note now that I'm always using the word practice in this course. 
It is a common mistake to think that you need to have these skills right off the bat, that they come out fully formed, or that they're natural and inherent in people. That is a complete myth. The difficult skills in life do require us to overcome our natural inclinations, which is laziness and inertia. Anyway, I recommend that you practice these mindsets over and over until they become a natural part of your thinking. One, inertia is natural, normal, and you must expect it. Look, there are going to be days when you just don't feel like it, and that's okay. Sometimes you do need a break, especially when you're learning difficult skills and there's a bit of mental overload, what's known as cognitive overload. But off days or days that you take off and not do anything are the exception. They cannot be the norm. So you must make sure that your off days are only the exception. That's the bit that takes effort. Two, you should see your frustration as a signal that something needs a bit more work. Now, I will talk about this a little bit more as we go through the course, but some things are signals and some things aren't. And frustration is a signal that whatever you're tackling at that point in time needs a little bit more work. It's, it's not that it's too difficult for you or that you're not smart enough. That's the wrong message to take out of frustration. Now, both may feel true in that moment. You may really feel that you're not smart enough or it's too hard for you. It's insurmountable for you. But with effort, both will be proved to be false. Or in other words, you put in the effort with the right mindset and you will show to yourself that you are smart enough and it wasn't that hard. Over time, it will yield to you. So frustration is just a signal that something needs a little bit more work and effort on your part or that you must just keep going. Three, try and have a growth mindset and not a fixed mindset. So this means that you should try to view your skills as a dynamic thing, something that evolves and grows and develops and improves over time. Don't see yourself as fixed or you will feel stuck and then it will become true for you that you can't actually grow. The mindset is critical here. In fact, these ideas have come from a phenomenal book by a uh, psychologist called Carol Dweck. Um, the book's called Mindset, and it's, it's an optional reading. I've, I'll include the, um, the links in, in, the, in the notes to this class. Um, or for a short synopsis, you may want to check out her popular TED Talk. It's, in fact, a very highly regarded TED Talk on exactly this subject, the growth mindset versus, versus the fixed mindset. Number four, remind yourself that time and energy will combine together to help you make progress. Now, another way to think of this energy is to think of it as effort. The point is that without putting in both time and effort slash energy, you are not likely to get to your goal. You can invert this concept if it helps and think of it as the only thing separating you from your goal is time and effort. That's it. Number five, expect and accept that your assessment of time and energy will almost always be wrong. Now, this is unfortunate but true. In fact, it's a well-known phenomenon documented and called the planning fallacy. Again, I'll include some um, notes and URLs if you want to look at it. It's not essential, but it's just good to know as part of your preparation that these things are normal and common and well-documented. Now, this planning fallacy, where things take longer or more time and energy um, than you anticipated, is just part of the learning. And as time goes on, you will get better at, at sensing that that's what's going on. But it doesn't mean you have to like it. I totally get it. But do try and accept it. It's possibly a fact of life that we just need to live with. Now, the more time you put in, the better you get at assessing how much time things will take. So initially, you'll get it wildly wrong. And over time, you'll get much better at estimating. You probably don't remember just how hard it was for you to write, to learn to write the alphabet, for example. Um, but if you watch a kindergarten kid, you can see how slowly he or she forms the A and the B and the C and the D. It's really, really hard for them. Sometimes um, they feel it's too hard um, when they can't remember the shape of a given letter. Now, it's the same principle for coding or for anything else that you're acquiring, a new skill that you're acquiring. At first, it's going to be really slow and frustrating. It'll be cognitively or mentally very hard for you. And that means it will take you longer than you're secretly hoping. So just be mindful of that. Develop the mindset that that's normal. It's part of the growing process. Don't be discouraged or too frustrated by that. Okay, you ready? Good. Let's keep going to the next section.
Okay, welcome back. In the last video, we talked about the essential mindsets and mentalities and attitudes that you need to have in order to get the most out of this course. Um, as you probably know, learning to code is like any other project. It requires a framework, a lot of planning, um, monitoring your own performance, your direction, your pace, and the outcomes you're achieving. When you get off track, you need to revisit the goals and bring yourself back on track. But for that, you need to actually have well laid out goals. Now, there are tons of frameworks that say the same things, but with different kind of words. A common framework that can be used for these kinds of planned activities, especially personal development projects, um, which I favor, is called the five W's and one H. The five W's are why, what, where, who, when. And the one H is the how. But, you know, to be honest, I think the how is covered by the what, where, who, and when. It's implicit and encapsulated in all of them. To me, all of that adds up to the how. So in the rest of this section of the course, not this video, just the section of this course, we are going to apply this 5W framework to you specifically. This framework will help you achieve one of your goals, total clarity. That's the goal. That's what this framework is going to help you get. Clarity on your expectations from yourself, from the process of learning, and your definition of success. We need clarity on all three. So at this stage, I think it's probably a good time for you to pause a bit and to think very carefully. And I mean this, just pause here and write out your expectations. What do you expect from yourself over the next 12 months in terms of your coding journey? What behaviors and commitments are you prepared to make? To what do you expect from this process of learning? So this could include a slow but steady rate of improvement, or you would expect frustration, or a sense of accomplishment, pride, progress. Next, have a think about what success looks like to you. It's very hard to know we've succeeded if we're not clear on what it looks like. Now, visualizing or identifying what a successful outcome looks like is, is a hard one. And most people don't spend enough time in being specific. But by defining realistic but big goals and being very clear on how you would know when you have achieved them, you can keep yourself very inspired and motivated. So definitely take a moment and think about those three things. But you know, don't worry too much as this is not a one-time exercise. You will need to keep refer returning to this and refining it all along your journey. As you get more information, as you learn more about code, as you learn about yourself and your learning style, keep coming back. So this is going to be a dynamic and constant exercise. But for now, it's a great idea to do some initial thinking and expectation setting right away. So stop now and do it. Okay, done that? Good. Now that you've done that, hold on to it. Sit on it for a bit. Um, over the next few sections and videos, we're going to spend time on each of those five W's, and this will help you think deeper on each of your answers, uh, refine them and improve them so that you have total clarity in your mind about what it is that you're seeking to achieve. And that clarity is going to be your compass through your entire coding journey. This is really important, guys. All right, I'll see you in the next video. Okay, welcome back. In the last video, we talked about the five W's and how each of them is really important and integral. Um, they're essential steps in you putting together your plan to achieve your learning goals. Now, in the next few videos, we're going to talk about each of those five W's and we're going to tackle each of them one at a time and go into some amount of detail. And let me tell you, this is going to be one of the most important exercises in self-reflection you're going to do. These five W's are going to be the things that you come back to over and over and over again every time you get discouraged or sidetracked or you know derailed as part of your learning journey. Um, there's going to be a lot of information that's confusing and that you're going to feel very conflicted about. And this is the stuff, um, the five W's in particular, that's going to really, really help you decide what to do next, reorient yourself towards your goals and just pursue them. So a very, very useful framework and going to be an ongoing part of your journey. So let's get started. 
Okay, well, the first thing I suggest we start with is why you want to learn to code. So why are you learning to code? Have a good think about this. I've got to admit, when I first asked myself this question, it seemed totally obvious. And I took my first response, the most superficial response, as the obvious right answer. That was a mistake. The reason it's a mistake is because sometimes we take the first answer as the real reason, but it's not. The first answer is, in fact, rarely the root reason as to why you want to do something. The way to get to the root reason is to keep asking yourself why. So literally, ask yourself why, you come up with an answer, ask yourself why that answer. Now, this is a little more clear with an example, so I'll share with you my personal example. And this is a snapshot from about one year into my first attempt to learn to code. When I first started, I really hadn't thought about why or what, or made any plan. And that was a huge mistake in hindsight. It cost me a lot of time and money and energy. I just decided instead that I wanted to write code. So here's my why from back then. Why? To write cool apps. Now, that seems like an obvious and very reasonable answer, and I dare say a lot of people have that, that thought in their head. But it's insufficient. It's not the whole story. And the problem with this answer is that it does not give you enough direction. Why? Because anything that could help you write a cool app then becomes part of your learning plan. And that is the wrong way to go about it. It's dangerously general. What sort of apps? Mobile, desktop, web apps, hybrid, scripts. Now, I learned this the hard way, a year after getting sidetracked and overwhelmed and doing too much irrelevant stuff. Instead, it should have been like this. Why? To write cool apps. Why? I want to launch my own product. Why? To pursue my entrepreneurial dreams. Why? Because I believe that this is what I would most enjoy in my life. Now, at some point, if you ask yourself why enough times, you will get to something you believe very, very strongly in. This is something that is fundamental to your reason to code. This is very, very important because it helps to answer the next question, which is, what do you want to learn to code? There are so many options here. So it is very important to work backwards from your goal. And here is a very important test. The answer to your what must correlate significantly to your why. Here's an example. For me, what do I want to build? A cool app. Okay, what kind? One that I can monetize into a product. Okay, what kind of product? Some sort of web app or software as a service? So what do I need to learn then? Web development, front end, back end, security and penetration testing, maybe not so much of that. Which languages help me do most of this? Actually, does the choice of language even matter? Now, this may seem obvious and easy, but I can promise you that if you're doing it properly, this will not be an instant exercise. In fact, it's going to take effort. You may need to spend an hour or more really thinking, really thinking hard. And once you have your top level learning objective, that is your primary learning goal, then you need to break that down into smaller chunks. For example, web dev, what does that mean? Front end, back end, or is it safe to ignore tutorials about authentication and security and database design, etc.? Let's start with web development basics then, for the front end perhaps. Well, that's just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now, your goals may be different. Maybe you want to get a job as a mobile developer or a job as a backend developer in Python or something like that. But you need to be crystal clear about your objective so that every hour of study and research that you invest is in a subject that takes you closer to your goal directly. And by that, I mean the shortest possible route between you and your goal. Some subjects may appear to be related or appealing or relevant, um, but are they critical to your goal? And you can see here that when you pursue 
the goals that are not quite critical or the learning objectives that are maybe indirect um, and merely represent nice-to-haves rather than the absolute essentials, your path to success is extremely convoluted and twisted and messy. That's why it's important to focus only on the must-have skills, the minimum skills required to attain your goals, and not be distracted by the nice-to-have skills. When learning a new skill, focus is the absolute key, and the less topics you do means the more progress you're going to make. So be very focused on the minimum requirements to achieve your goal and separate your learning tasks into the must-haves and the nice-to-haves. There is no one right answer. So this takes practice and refinement over time. And like I said, discipline. Now, it's your turn. Take a moment, step away from the computer or your phone and write down your whys followed by your what's and make sure that they correlate. Then come back and put it down in the exercise that follows this video and share it with others. Welcome back. In the last video, we covered the first of the two Ws, which is why you want to learn to code and what you want to code. Now, in this section, we're going to talk about the third W, the who. Specifically, who are you going to get support from on your learning journey? As with any journey, you need a good map. And if you're a hiker, you know that different maps can cause confusion and frustration. The same principle applies to learning a new skill, like coding. Finding a person to model is critical because that is the best map or compass to have. To choose the best people, you need to have done the exercises around identifying what you want to achieve in the previous videos. Now, just a quick side note, and I apologize, but I'm probably going to repeat this several times, but it's really, really important. Anytime you adjust one of the W's in your 5W plan, please, please make sure that you examine all the other W's and update them as necessary. All right, getting back to choosing the best people. My suggestion and my experience has been it's best to choose one or two people who have done what you would like to do. If they've achieved your goals, that is, they've done what you intend to do, then they are the people to model. That's it. Now, a very quick update for 2024, because of the rise of the way social media has started to influence people and just the amount of content out there that's being produced by people, I think it's now even more important than ever before to distinguish between opinions, especially since there's no shortage of that on the internet, and actual advice. And the definition I adopt, which I found to help me a lot, uh, which I hope will help you, is opinions are what most people have as a point of view, and usually they may or may not actually have directly done or um, being ex uh, experienced in what you're trying to do. However, advice by definition to me can only come from someone who's done exactly what I'm trying to do, who have direct lived experience of that. Everything else is just an opinion. And I've learned, especially as more and more stuff comes out in the internet, to just tune out that it's not so much who I follow or who I listen to anymore. Most of my work is spent tuning things out, right? And just finding one or two, you don't need more than that, people who actually have done what I'm trying to do um, and who are able to share their experience on it. Ideally, somebody really close, somebody who I can meet in person, if not somebody I can speak to on the phone or online, and if not interact with, you know, via um, LinkedIn or whatever it is, right? So those are the layers. So I'd encourage you to really be strict about the kind of people you take uh, information from, because to be honest, nine times out of 10, especially these days, a lot of information is sent out by people who've never actually done stuff. They may have read a book or, you know, um, followed some other influence and they're trying to sort of build expertise in that area. To be honest, without having lived the experience, if you haven't actually gone to, to Rome, you can't really describe what Rome um, is like to someone, no matter how many YouTube videos you watched, right? So that's the kind of analogy I'd use there. So think about that very carefully and try and protect your focus and your mind space as much as you can by tuning out, excluding, rather than let, letting too many points of view come in, because that'll just confuse you a lot. That's the most important and probably the only really meaningful, helpful rule. Think of them as mentors or models. I mean, pick, pick a label that makes you happy. The name doesn't really matter. The important thing is, how do you find these people? Well, in some cases, you may actually know them. And you'd be surprised at how many very, very eligible mentors or models are actually around you. Just don't overlook someone only because they've not yet made it big or found a job. 
you know, they may be three months or six months ahead of you on the journey, but that's very valuable too. And then there's always social media. I've found great success with looking up people on Twitter or YouTube and LinkedIn and just reaching out. And often online communities are great places to find people um, you can get inspiration from or get guidance from. Personally, I found fantastic models from online communities like the Free Code Camp community, some on Reddit, some Slack channels, and so on. Now, it's tempting to go a bit crazy and spend all your time on these social media sites and you know accumulate a bunch of people that you can go to. I suggest you don't do that. That'll actually waste you more time than it'll save you. In my experience, the optimum range is you need one to three solid, reliable, trustworthy people. And while many people may not be as available as you would like, they are usually more available and approachable than you think, even if you reach out cold on, on Twitter or even YouTube. So just reach out. There's only benefits to be had. You may just find yourself a fantastic model who's happy to help you. You should set your expectations. What you want from these models, just practical advice, not inspirational advice. Inspiration is good, but at the end of the day, it can run out, whereas practical advice will make you move forward. So I don't generally think that having models like billionaire startup founders is very helpful. It can actually be counterproductive, especially since it's hard to separate fiction from fact when it comes to learning from them and their experience, unless you happen to know them personally, and then they can have an honest conversation with you about their experience. So... Let's now talk about in what moments or what times along your journey that you're going to need a mentor or a model. The answer is really anytime you're confused about what the right next step is for you. Do you want to learn this framework? Framework? Should you build a skill? Should you learn um, this particular tech stack? Should you apply for that kind of job? These are the questions you can take to a good mentor. A great time to consult your mentor or one of your models is when you're receiving a lot of conflicting and confusing information because they can help you when you're stuck. Conflicting information is a big problem and we'll talk about it later. This happens quite often, especially initially. And so saving time by turning to someone close by to help explain things to you or give you a valuable perspective is worth hours, if not weeks and days of your time. Now, the internet is full of opinions, so getting conflicting information happens all the time. And some of these opinions, I should warn you, would probably suggest the opposite of what you want or where you're headed. That's okay. You just need to know when to listen and when to ignore these opinions. And that's often easier said than done. That's where mentors can help. Also, having a clear line of sight with your goals and your five W's will help you decide which opinions to listen to and which not to. Now, rather than getting stuck in circles in your head, it's often just better to talk to one of your mentors or model who's been through that sort of confusion before. Ultimately, folks, the role of the mentor is to make sure that the next step you take is the one that takes you closer to your goal. That's what you end up using your mentor for. Now, they'll not always have the right answers. They may not even agree with you, and that's okay. You need their perspectives to test your assumptions and your needs against your decisions that you plan to make. They will help you make a better decision. And that could even be something as small as avoiding a misstep, or avoiding wasted time, or barking up the wrong tree, something that could derail you. If they can help avoid that, they've done their job as a mentor or a model. Ultimately, they're there to help you make the best choice, the best next step, which is much easier when someone else has walked down the path before. They can also give you a perspective on what they went through and how they approach similar problems or conundrums. That's really, really valuable. Sometimes, and I've had this a few times, they'll give you advice that they wish they really had. And in my opinion, if someone tells you what they wish they'd had and actually gives you what they wish they'd had, that's worth your weight in gold because they're saving you the time and effort and money that they may have lost and preventing you from losing that. A trusted advisor who did what you want is really worth a thousand times more than someone on opinion who has never wanted what you want or maybe wanted it but never actually tried. So limit the amount of time you take these opinions. Another tip, Twitter advice is just as valuable as a coffee meetup if it gives you the answer you're looking for. So don't be specific in the format of the mentor interaction. The idea of a mentor interaction is to get you the information you need to take the next step. 
All right, enough for this section. I'll see you in the next video. So goals like work, they, they follow Parkinson's law. The work just expands to fill the time available for its completion. That's just how it is. So that's why I guess people talk about SMART goal setting, S-M-A-R-T, which is an acronym. And it stands for Specific, Me Measurable, Achievable, Realistic, and Time Bound, which is really what this, this video is about. It's about the T or the when by, the time bound aspect. But to do that well, you need to ensure that you've correctly broken down your goals. So it's a little bit more complicated than just setting a time or a when by date. One very common mistake in setting timelines for goals is that the goals are just too large and they're non-specific and they're not broken down into specific pieces. So for example, you could say, I'm going to learn to code by December 2019. But you won't know when you've completed that because learning to code is just not specific enough and arguably the timeline is too far away. Setting a faraway timeline for a large goal is kind of meaningless, but it's done very often. Instead, you'd be much better off breaking down the large goal into smaller measurable goals or sub-goals that are easy to cover with metrics. And ideally, there'd be a metric that you can track and measure daily or very frequently, maybe twice a week or even weekly. Some examples could be, I'm going to finish this three-hour course by Sunday evening. Then I'm going to do two hours of HTML every single night, so I have the basic concepts of HTML down by the end of the week. After that, I'm going to understand the basics of CSS with that four hour long YouTube video, and I will finish that by Wednesday night. So the trick is to break it down into smaller chunks that are very obvious when you've achieved them or completed the milestone. So a tutorial is either complete or not. A video is complete or not. A section in this course is complete when the video in that section ends. These things are clear. They're clear lines in the sand. You know when you've achieved them. There's no question about whether the goal has not been achieved or has been achieved. It's pretty binary. These kind of goals will also give you an idea of the size of the task, um, which means you can assess the time better. Another thing to watch out for is it's best not to go too far into the future as you will lo lose motivation. It's actually really important as a learning strategy to give yourself lots of quick wins constantly as that will give you the clear sense of progress. It'll keep you motivated and energized because you can see progress. The sooner you achieve a goal, the more likely it is you'll develop the habit of succeeding at achieving goals because you're constantly getting the reinforcement feedback loop that you're achieving your goals. And one last thing for you to keep in mind before we close out on this video, you know, sometimes life does get in the way and it slows you down and that's okay. Life happens. Just make sure you're not the one slowing yourself down. A couple of videos ago, we did talk about, you know, off days are all right as long as that's not the norm. So similarly, if life gets in the way, that's understandable. Don't beat yourself up. Set very hard to achieve timelines. That's important because it'll make you more confident and focused. But at the same time, if life gets in the way, just readjust those timelines a little bit. But keep the smart principles in mind. All right, on to the next video. Okay, so in the last video, we covered the fourth W, which is when by. And now, in this video, we are going to talk about the fifth and final W, which is where. In the context of your learning plan, where means where you're going to learn from. That is, what resources and learning formats work best for you to achieve your learning goals. I will start by sharing with you how I worked out my best learning format over the years and how that changed. So back when I first tried to learn to code, it was about 2014, and MOOCs, that's massively open online courses, were just starting to become mainstream. You can see from this chart how it was still early days back in 2013. But back then, I discovered two things about myself. One is, I was used to learning in classes and via books. Two, I hadn't really considered video as a way to teach myself, and that took some getting used to. I mean, I finished university in 2003 and the world was a very different place then. Google wasn't even listed as a public company back then. B, 
bit by bit, I did start to get into videos, but I discovered that a lot of the content was by technical people for technical people and presumed a certain level of prior knowledge, which wasn't that beginner friendly for someone like me. So I found it was much easier to just use books, even though some were slightly outdated. Bit by bit, though, it became very intimidating for me to see these massive and thick books sitting on my desk, each covering a lot of content, but, you know, at the end of it, they sort of tell you that you've only just started to scratch the surface. So it was visually and intellectually quite overwhelming to have all that content and feel like progress was incredibly slow. Over time, I then discovered other resources that started to pop up really valuable resources like Free Code Camp and Code Academy and Code Avengers um, that all offered a multimedia experience while making you actually write some code to get a real feel for it. Over time, I returned back to MOOCs, especially in places like Udemy and Coursera, where the content had started to mature quite a bit. Now, by this time, keep in mind, it was 2018, and I'd already quit twice before that. But between 2014 and 2017, while I kept dabbling and trying it occasionally, a lot had changed online. The quality of the content, the design of courses, and also the sheer number of coders who were sharing their knowledge openly online for free. YouTube had become a huge resource for me. Following that, I started to turn more and more to tutorial sites online, places like Tutorials Point. I even found a few US coding boot camps that had um, sites that helped you prepare for their entrance tests that were incredibly useful in getting me to practice fundamental concepts. But you know, all this over those three years took a lot of trial and error and cost me an enormous amount of time and energy and frustration. I really think that had I had the benefit of something like this, this course that you're doing now, I would have got the same results with one third the wastage of time. So I'm going to give you some of my learnings from that period in my life, steps that helped me choose the best learning formats, and I really believe that these steps are going to optimize your path to your goal. Number one, you take your first learning goal or objective, and then you learn that and achieve that goal from different sources. So let's say, for example, you want to try to learn the different types of data in a programming language and how to assign and recall a piece of data in a program. Let's say you've even started with Java, and we'll get into choosing the right language later on in this course. But let's say you start with Java. So what you should then do is first try an online blog or tutorial or some form of text, learn the principles from there. Then you move on to a classic textbook and see if that works for you. Then you go and listen to a podcast, then maybe watch a couple of YouTube videos, and then do it on Codecademy or Free Code Camp or you know both or what you choose the places you want to do it from. Number two, when you do the same thing from so many different resources, you will find that you get a lot of practice and reinforcement of the principles. Like these fundamentals actually get quite firmly entrenched in your brain, which is exactly what you want. But more interestingly, you're going to also have a sense of which format was really effective for your learning. Maybe you had a eureka moment while listening to a podcast or watching a YouTube video. Or, you know, in my case, for example, I found that videos took me less time to absorb critical information than reading a tutorial did. And I was able to comprehend and assimilate and recall much better when I watched videos. So you've got to assess the format that works for you. Not everyone is going to love videos the way I ended up loving them towards the end. The third step, number three, eliminate a few of those learning formats by choosing only the top two, maximum three formats that actually worked well for you. Once you've got your top three, two or three formats, you repeat this process all over again with your next learning goal. You try again but you confine yourself to those top two or three formats. Keep tweaking and measuring your results and seeing which ones work really well for you, and you'll find that different topics um, are better covered by different resources, and you'll discover that with time and practice. What is really important here, though, is for you to monitor your learning effectiveness over time, as what works for you today is not going to work for you that well in two years. If you've evolved, you'll find that you can actually use other learning resources that today are too hard for you, but are actually really appropriate for you in two years' time. Okay, so let's quickly recap what we learned about in this video. We've talked about different learning formats. We've talked about 
how some work better for you and some may not work that well for you, how you've got to start an iterative process of experimenting and finding out which ones work really well for you by choosing the same learning goal and learning what you need to learn from different resources. Hey guys, just a quick interlude here to update for 2023, 2024. Figuring out where to actually learn from is now much harder than it was even four years ago, five years ago. And the reason is you know, every year we double the amount of data produced by humanity through digital content, right? So literally every hour there are more YouTube videos being produced than most people can consume in a lifetime. And so what's happening is there's a lot of noise in the system now which means it's really hard to figure out what content is going to be relevant for you, right? So I fully recognize this is a problem. Some of the previous comments I've, I've provided in the training, or it may come up in later parts of this course over and over again, is figuring out what's the difference between opinion and advice. So look out for that, that section as well. But in general, it's also important to know that a lot of coding tutorials and material are written by coders for existing coders looking to adopt new technologies. For those of you who've never coded before, that's not what you need to look at. You will absolutely overwhelm yourself. Instead, you need to be looking at coding resources for absolute newbies who've never coded before. That's a little bit harder to find, and they're also you know harder to sort of make much progress with because they literally cover just the beginning, but you need to layer and layer. Just like a cake, you need to add layers to your learning, right? So look for stuff that is not, for example, here's an example. I once got caught in this thing about you know Python for programmers, this course, right? But what I didn't realize and realize is that the title actually kind of hints at it. It says Python for programmers, which means it presumes that you're already a programmer and you're trying to pick up a new language being Python, right? And I was a complete beginner and I knew nothing about programming. So, you know, watch out for little gotchas like that. And keep in mind that the content that we're seeing out there these days is a lot of it is open source content, which means people without much experience or depth or who are learning like you are writing a lot of blogs as part of their learning process. And so that gets sh surfaced by search engines or social media, whatever it is. And it's not often great to learn from, to be honest, right? Because you're learning from people who are sort of slightly ahead of you. It's, it's great that they're able to do that, that they're teaching, that they're learning by teaching, which is something I recommend doing, but I don't recommend adding to the content of the internet generally like that. Like if you're going to do it, do it, you know, one-on-one -on -one or tell another friend or somebody else in a small group so that you're not kind of uh, filling up the internet with stuff that's going to come up in search engines that may not be right. Having said that, keep in mind that a lot of people producing content out there are also just learning and the content may not be great. It may not be written well. It may not follow the pedagogical styles required to actually help you accumulate the knowledge and so on. Uh, you know, And so you will end up having a lot of stuff that doesn't help you. So it's really important when you pick these resources that you keep this in mind, look for the correct level that is yours. And if in the first three or four paragraphs, it doesn't feel like the right level, abandon it. Don't feel bad. It just means that it was pitched for a different audience. Now, I teach a lot as part of my current role. And this is an actual, this is actually a big problem from the teacher's point of view as well. What level of, of person are we targeting at? And if you're not explicit about it, it can be very confusing for other people. So it's actually a really hard problem to solve. So just recognize that you have to be kind to yourself and to the people who produce, producing content out that's not possible to work for everybody. There is no one size fits all. So there's a little bit of trial and error that's unavoidable. But it's much harder these days to figure out the resources um, that are not curated because there's just so much stuff there, right? Just remember, level yourself. Are you an absolute beginner or are you fairly you know, competent at the basics? And accordingly, look for resources at that level. And if you're using things like ChatGPT, ChatGPT is quite often wrong. In fact, if you sometimes challenge ChatGPT, even if it's right and you say that's actually not right, it'll immediately apologize to you. So it's obviously not that confident of its answer in the first place. So, you know, keep that in mind. Now, we've actually come to the end of section one at this stage. And section one was only designed to help you formulate a well-structured plan that is specific to your goals. And I think by the end of the section, you would have done that. From here on, we're going to start picking apart the major reasons why many people give up on their plans. And we want to absolutely make sure that that does not happen to you. Okay, so let's keep going. All right, welcome back. In the last bunch of videos, we covered some really essential parts of putting together your plan to achieve your learning goals. Um, in, in particular, we covered things like the why, the what the where, the whom, and the when by that you're going to try and put together into your plan. And all these aspects are so essential for you to be able to achieve your learning objectives. Now, I'm fairly confident in saying that by this point of time, just having that plan 
puts you ahead of about 95% of your competition because you have a solid plan, you have a solid map that helps you navigate to your learning outcomes. So let's keep moving and now we're going to talk about the big myths that stand in the way. Now the plan that we've put together for you will evolve and I encourage you to keep revisiting it for two reasons. One, to check that you are following it and that things that are going to plan, that you're tracking well to the plan. And two, this is the fun bit, to check whether you've gained any new knowledge that requires you to adjust and revise your plan just a little bit from time to time. In the next few videos, I'm going to cover some of the top myths that surround the process of learning to code. Now, let me be clear here, I am not addressing the myths of what it's like to be a professional coder or what a developer job is like. I'm very specifically identifying the common myths and misconceptions that people have about learning to code. Think of it as the expectations, specifically the false expectations that people have when they start to learn to code. So why is that important? And it is really important. Well, it's important for three reasons. Here they are. One, having a picture that is false or unrealistic in your mind can be a major source of frustration, doubt, and setbacks. Two, myths can make you overestimate the learning task or underestimate it, and both are bad. Learning to recognize and identify these myths will help you ask the right questions and get the answers that are most helpful to you. Remember, my goal is to save you time, money, and effort and make sure that you do not fail in your quest to become a coder. Reason three, false expectations make things harder than they need to be. And doing things the hard way is a form of waste. And what do I keep saying? Eliminating waste is a very important part of succeeding at our goals. And that includes the goals of this course. Now that we understand why this section on myths is important, Let's talk quickly about why I'm covering this material at this stage and not later. I've spent days designing the structure of this course so that each section, each bunch of videos, prepares you for the sections that follow. The sequence is meant to make it exponentially easier for you to make decisions and analyze your objectives every step of the way. So you may want to rush ahead into other sections so that you can start learning immediately, and I, and I understand that. But I would caution you against that, and I would advise you to invest a couple of hours now in following the structure of the course so that you can save yourself a few weeks of time later on. I promise I will cover some of your burning questions. For example, in the next section, the next bunch of videos, we will talk about the fundamental decisions that you need to make, including, for example, what language you want to start with. You will make a much better decision if you've finished this section, though. At the very, very least, you will have confidence in your choice and not be distracted by niggling doubts and second-guessing yourself about whether your decision was arbitrary or well-informed or the right one for you. So following the sequence is important because it then gives you the confidence in your decision-making every step of the way. Okay, so we've agreed. Let's stick to the courses part and you're going to be just fine. Great. See you in the next video for myth number one. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about the first myth, the first of several myths that stand in the way of you chaining your goals. Just to be clear, I'm not covering off these myths in this section in any particular order of importance. They're just common myths. It's also very possible that you don't believe in one or all of them, but in my experience, these are some extremely common myths that hold people back from achieving their learning objectives, and I believe these are the most important ones that will help you continue down on your journey. The first myth that we are going to talk about is whether or not computer science is the same as coding. They're not. Many people do believe that you need to have a computer science background to be a good coder or perhaps an effective coder. Let me tell you, this is absolutely and categorically not true. Most of the world's coders are not computer science graduates, statistically. And the reason for this goes to the heart of the difference between knowing how to code and knowing the principles of computer science. Here is a great summary of it. Computer science is theoretical. It takes a scientific and mathematical approach to information and its computation. 
Computer programming is practical. It is the process of designing, writing, testing, debugging, and maintaining the source code of computer programs. They are different but related fields. So computer science is the science of computing and includes all stuff about the hardware, the software, and theoretical capabilities and limitations of computers. Whereas writing software is simply literally writing out the instructions to a computer so that it can execute it. That is part of the reason why it's hard to know where the line is that you must cross to become a coder. There is no line beyond which you can suddenly say, hey, I'm a coder. Now, there are computer scientists who are fantastic at algorithms and conceptual designs and the theoretical side of it, but who just aren't very practiced or experienced coders, and so they're not great coders, mainly because they've only really looked at the theoretical side of the art. In fact, you can see some fairly controversial posts on this subject on Reddit and other forums, and I've added a couple of links in the lecture resources if you're interested, but my advice is, you know, don't spend too much time asking why that difference exists or what the meaning of it is. The only question to ask yourself that's relevant is, why does this matter to you? So it is critical to know your what and your why to determine if you need to have a computer science background. That's a really good thing then that we've done that thinking, right? If you want to build a blog site, for example, you don't need to know much CS. If you want to build a mobile app, chances are you won't. Nowadays, let's face it, if you want to learn data science, analytics, or even intermediate level AI, you probably don't need a solid computer science background. But if you're doing cutting edge computing R&D work, or working for a team, a startup, let's say, that's optimizing scalable technology um, that's going to change the world in some way, it may help you set it may help separate you from the competition if you do know a little computer science or CS. Now, there is one practical case which will immediately help you. If you're looking for jobs, then it's best to do some research into which jobs require a CS degree. Here are, for example, two completely random examples taken off the internet. One from the Google career site and the other from Stack Overflow's jobs listings. The first one, the Google role, has minimum qualifications that require a computer science degree or equivalent practical experience. And the preferred qualifications include a PhD. Now, I would guess that if you want a job like this, you're better off doing a computer science degree. It will certainly improve your odds of getting an interview. But for the other role, the one on Stack Overflow jobs, if you look at it, it's a full stack job. And you can see that they seem to care more about your ability with certain languages and frameworks and technologies. They don't really seem to care too much about your formal qualifications. They seem to be more interested in your technical ability to execute and stuff. So to be clear, having a knowledge of computer science topics is probably helpful and probably even makes you a better coder, but it is by no means essential, certainly not essential to learn how to code. Most programmers don't have CS degrees. It's just not necessary for what they do day to day. With experience and time, you'll start to pick up some CS principles, but that comes later. And at this stage of your learning, it's the sort of thing that can derail you unless you absolutely need it. So like I've said before, give yourself quick wins with smaller chunks and smaller goals, provided each such chunk or goal is actually necessary to your larger learning goal. Okay, enough on that. Let's recap quickly. In this video, we covered the fundamental differences between computer science and programming, and we've established they're not the same thing. You can be an expert in one without knowing much about the other, and that swings both ways. Choosing your learning objectives must always be done by referring to your goals, so before you work out whether or not you need a CS degree, take a quick look at your what and your why, which are the underpinnings of your goals, and you'll know what it is that you need to do to get there. But always, always start with small chunks that give you quick wins. Okay, let's move on to the next video where we're going to cover myth number two. Okay, welcome back. In the last video, we talked about myth number one, which is whether or not computer science and programming are the same skill. Specifically, we discussed whether you need to be a computer scientist in order to be a good programmer. In this video, we're going to talk about myth number two, which is quite similar to myth one in the look and feel. And the myth is that you need to be great at math to be an effective programmer. 
because I'm calling this a myth, I think you know what the answer is going to be. And you can be very relieved that the answer to that is no, you do not need to be fantastic at math to be an effective programmer. Unless, of course, your goal is to work in a deeply theoretical and highly technical field where the R&D or the research and development you need to do gets immediately applied to real-world applications and the R&D itself is quite math-heavy. But that's quite a niche area. So, in general, to be an effective coder, no, you don't need math. Math does help to get you closer to the computer science side of things. So if you are going to be doing computer science, then math skill definitely gives you an advantage. But my personal belief is everything is learnable, and that includes math. The reality of today's development world, though, is that 99% or so of programmers do things that are based off existing libraries, where a lot of the hard math is already done. And that includes really complex math-heavy subjects like data science and machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so on. Maybe a better question then is to ask why math helps. So it's not that you need to have good math skills to be a, a good programmer, but having math skills could really help. So why is that? Well, one of the reasons why it could really help is because math teaches you to break down problems and solve complex problems in a structured, systematic, piece-by-piece -piece way. And it requires you to hold a lot of pieces of information, sometimes competing pieces of information, in your head while you think through it in a structured, logical way. So what does that tell us? Maybe it's not the knowledge of math specifically, but the ability to think logically in a structured way that math requires that is actually valuable as a programmer. In other words, you don't need to be good at math, you need to be good at thinking logically and in a structured way. Now, these skills are very, very valuable as a programmer, not essential, but valuable. But you will acquire them bit by bit with more code and practice. Now, initially, it is entirely likely that you would be uncomfortable and feel intimidated because you compare yourself with people who started years before you did. Now, I, I made that mistake several times. I look at accomplished programmers and, you know, they're six to ten years out ahead of where I am and marvel at their ability. The reality is when I was a fairly senior lawyer, new lawyers would look at me and think that I had special extraordinary skills and I didn't. Well, Compared to them, I did, but that was only because of experience and practice. Now, I can assure you that what you're going through in terms of comparing yourself with other people who are way ahead of you in the path is natural and normal. Maybe not the most helpful thing, because every skill is 100% learnable. I've said this before, and I'll keep saying it. Time and effort are the only thing that separate you from a goal. We do live in a culture that tells us that genius is some innate thing. I don't believe it. In fact, it's scientifically invalid. From Einstein to Edison, People have been careful to point out that genius is the result of hard work and not the cause of any success and accomplishment. If you want to know more, take a look at books like Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers or Eric Anderson's book called Peak, which talks about how people acquire excellence. But that's a little bit of a diversion or a little bit of a tangent to where we are now. For now, all I'm saying is don't be intimidated by math. It is useful, but not essential. So don't continue to intimidate yourself with this myth. You can develop that skill if it's really important to what you want, but it may not be. So again, knowing your what and your why is critical before you can assess whether you need a certain kind of skill. All right, enough on that myth two. Let's move to myth three. Okay, welcome back. In the last video, we talked about myth number two, which is whether or not you need to be a math whiz to be a good programmer. In this video, we're going to talk about myth number three, which is extremely common and one of my favorite myths to try and get rid of. It is that a lot of people think coding, oh, that's not something I could do. That's just too hard for me. Let me tell you, that is absolutely and categorically not true. In fact, empirically, if you look around, there are just so many programmers in the world, some as young as four years old. So it's obviously not too hard for you. That is just statistically not possible. So there are three important things to note about this myth. One, it is partly true, and that's what makes it so believable. Two, the part that is true is that coding is hard. And three, the path that is false is that you cannot do it. Let's break this down properly. Coding is hard. 
but then you know so is learning to walk and and maybe you don't remember that so let's try something that happened a little later in life like learning to write well maybe you don't remember that either hmm okay how about learning to ride a bicycle or learning to swim learning a second language or a third language or learning to drive how about learning to use Microsoft Excel at work learning anything new is hard and the difference is that some things we just learn along the way so we don't pay attention to the effort it takes and how hard it is because we just pick it up along the way but unless you happen to be living with a disability generally learning to walk write or read or drive are things that we simply assume we take it for granted we will all do this one day our kids will do this one day etc there's nothing unusual about these fairly complex skills and in 20 years I am 100% sure they're going to say the same thing for coding. Kids in 20 years will just code like it's the most normal thing in the world, which means coding is not hard for you. It's hard for everyone, but everyone can do it. So the key here is to catch yourself when you're thinking that it's hard specifically for you. Nope, it's hard for everyone. Remind yourself that learning to drive a walk is also really hard, but we take for granted we can do it and we never doubt our ability. Sure, some people take a little longer, they may need a little more practice, but no one really doubts that they can do it. And that exact same attitude applies to coding because it's a fact. So let's recap. Coding is hard, but not just for you. And it's no harder than any other skill that we take for granted in our modern culture, and certainly no harder than at least two or three other skills that you probably already have. Okay, enough said on that. Let's move on to myth number four. Okay, welcome back. In the last video, we talked about the myth that it's too hard for some of us to learn to code. In this video, we're going to talk about an unspoken assumption that many people share, or it's a misconception that a lot of people don't even know that they've fallen into, which is that coding is something that can be done very quickly like they show it in the movies. This is especially common for people who want to code to build something that they want to see in their lives or for a startup idea they've got, something that they want to prototype quickly. You know, this myth is a huge factor for the frustration and disappointment that cause people to give up. Popular media will make us believe that you can become a hacker quickly, almost instantly with prodigious ability and put together a world-changing prototype from your dorm room or garage in a weekend. It's false. And if you don't believe me, listen to this guy. Movies and pop culture just get this all wrong. The idea of a single eureka moment is a dangerous lie. It makes us feel inadequate because we feel like we haven't had ours yet. And it prevents people with seeds of good ideas from ever getting started in the first place. Oh, and you know what else movies get wrong about innovation? No one writes math formulas on glass, okay? <laughs> All right, that's not a thing, okay? Guys, even Mark Zuckerberg is telling you that it's very dangerous to fall into the myth of thinking that these things happen very quickly, that you can learn or build something very, very quickly. It's so dangerous that it causes people to either not start or to give up too early. Even he's saying it, and I 100% agree especially with skills like coding. It can take so much longer than you expect that if your expectations are too false, you run the real risk of giving up. I cannot emphasize this enough and I do not want you guys to give up because of mismatched expectations and that's why this myth is so important. Do not think that it's going to be quick, instant and glorious. It is really not. But it is totally possible with time and effort. Okay? So apart from pop culture and the myth of the weekend entrepreneur, you also have significant marketing effort being put into telling you that you can learn to code in a weekend or four hours or 10 hours or whatever it is. Some will say that you will be job ready in three months and technically they're right, but it is slightly misleading. Most coders learn by doing. And if you don't do that thing that you're learning, again for a little while you will forget it in other words you need to keep repeating and keep doing more of it in order for it to get entrenched in your memory 
So you can absolutely learn the basics in a month, maybe two or three, depending on how much time you're putting into it and how much focused energy you're putting into it. The key message here, though, is to be prepared that whatever the timelines you're being sold on, what they're not telling you is how much time you've got to put in per day to achieve that timeline. And that's what you need to factor in. Coding takes a lot of time. Now, you never actually stop learning to code, but that's partly because coding takes so much more time than you expect. And because it takes so much more time, you learn for much longer periods of time as you wade through it. So if you do happen to think that you're going to learn Python in two weeks and build up an email or Twitter bot in the week after, you absolutely could by copying it from a tutorial and working your way through that. But it's not really meaningfully learning the actual skill of what you're putting together. You're just copying it from a tutorial. And lots of people confuse the ability to build an application with actually learning to program. They, they're slightly different things. It's very easy to follow a tutorial and build a program, and you will learn a little bit from doing that, but the real, real learning comes from getting royally stuck. And getting unstuck can take a lot of time, but believe me, that's where you do most of the learning, where you have the eureka moments that really make the penny drop and the lesson drive home. So, Coding is not something you can learn very quickly. You can absolutely learn the basics fairly quickly, but you need to practice it to become good. And the best learning, unfortunately, happens when you get stuck. And when you get stuck, it takes a lot of time to get unstuck. Therefore, the best learning, which happens out of getting stuck, takes a lot of time because getting unstuck takes time. And I hope you see that logic there. So let's recap quickly. You can absolutely learn to code well and learn to program a computer very well over time. You get faster at picking up new things the more you learn and as more time goes on. But inherently, it's not a quick process. So do not set yourself up for failure with unreasonable expectations that you can read a textbook and build your startup this weekend. Okay, I'll see you in the next and final myth. Okay, welcome back. In this video, we're going to cover the last myth for now. Myth number five is the last myth at the moment. But I want you to know that I will be looking very closely at the information I keep getting, especially from information from people like you, as to other myths that should be added to this section, because this section will have all the content I can find on the myths that need to be dispelled. So if you know of other myths that you think affect a lot of people, please do let me know. This section will keep growing to accommodate those myths because my goal continues to be and will always be to try and remove as many obstacles as I can from your path to learning how to code. And myths are a huge obstacle they really do set a lot of people back. So if you have ideas, please do let me know. Um, but keep coming back to the section to see if anything more has been added because I hope to add a lot more to this. All right, let's keep going to the rest of myth five. Okay, so the last myth that we're going to cover for now is that coding is boring and geeky. A, a lot of pop culture will have you believe that coding is for just the nerds and the geeks and the socially inept. But we, I think now we can all accept that that's not true anymore. As Steve Jobs said, everyone should know how to program a computer because it teaches you how to think. So if thinking is boring and geeky, then we do have bigger problems as a society, I guess. But if you think that thinking is important, then learning to code just makes you better at something that you already know is important. On a more practical note, however, coding is extremely creative. In that sense, it is an art that lets you create in software what doesn't happen easily in the physical world. From gaming to music to art to, to entertainment shows to helping people with disability, using software to improve and shape the world around you is very powerful and very, very creative. Software is absolutely just a tool. It's just like an artist's paintbrush or a sculptor's chisel. You use it to shape the world around you and to give form to the ideas and imagination in your head. Today, your imagination can be converted to reality through code, something that for the, mass, for the vast history of mankind, we couldn't do. What makes coding really special is that it's not just an art. It is extremely, extremely practical, and it requires you to constantly solve problems. 
Some problems are hard. Some problems are just really unusual and interesting. But the science does show unequivocally that solving problems gives the brain a chemical rush and lights up all the reward centers in your brain. So quite literally, solving good problems makes people happier and more fulfilled. And coding is all about solving problems. Now, imagine doing something that makes you happier the more you do it. That doesn't sound like work at all, right? So if the popular narrative is that coding is for geeks, well, try it out for yourself. Lots of cool people code. The world has never loved coders more. And to top it all off, it's highly creative, deeply satisfying, and good for you, mentally and emotionally. And it puts you in a flow state. So if you want to code, be proud of it, go for it. It's fantastic. Just keep going and don't hold yourself back because of these kind of myths and falsehood. Okay, welcome back. Um, we're now at the last video of this section for now. I know we've had a big section going through all the myths and the misconceptions that often can bring us down and derail us in our approach to coding. I know some of you may not want to hear this right now, and I know you may not even really be ready for this, but I would strongly encourage you to pause for about 15 to 20 minutes now and revisit the goals and plan that you had put together at the end of section one. If you remember, section one was all about the five W's and how that influences your goal setting and on the back of which you can build a proper plan. Now is a good time to go back and revisit that, revisit that plan because now that you've understood the myths and false expectations that often subconsciously influence our decision making, you may see Maybe you won't, but you may see that your plan and goals reflect those false assumptions, those false expectations, and those myths. If they do, now is a great time to revise your plan and goals, taking into account what you've learned in this section about myths and removing those myths from your plan. The benefit of that is it makes your plan much more strong and much more achievable for you. And I know I've harped on this several times so far in this course, but it's really important that your goals are robust so that that reduces the odds that you're going to fail or give up. That is very, very important. Remember, it's one of our shared goals in this program. So go back and do that now for about 10 or 15 minutes. If you need to adjust your plan to reflect what you've learned in the section, go ahead and do it and take the time to do it right. Very importantly, if you found some myths or expectations had crept into your plan and goal setting, I would really love for you to share that in the Q&A with your peers. Help your peers to see what you saw after coming this far in the course. And maybe that'll help them revisit their plan. That'll also help them learn what you have learned. Likewise, you can learn from others who've shared in the forums. So this makes it a much richer experience for all of us. And I personally would absolutely love to see things through your eyes and read about your experience revisiting your plan in the forums because I think that'll help me make this an even better course for you to return to. All right, well, I'll see you in the next section because it's going to be fun. So in this section, what I'd like to talk to you guys about is some of the big gotchas, right? These are things that are really high risk factors. And this wasn't actually, this section wasn't there in the original course. And the reason I added it is in the last you know three or four years, I've coached several hundred students on career change to code. And I've noticed a few patterns, and these patterns are what I call the risk factors, okay? So I want to cover them all with you because you're going to get the benefit of all the work I've done over the last four years with hundreds of students, and you're going to see the main reasons why people fail, especially in either learning to code or career change, which, you know, are two different things. So in identifying these risk factors, they're like potholes on the road or big, you know, barricades in the middle of the road. And so by knowing them in advance, your forearmed is forewarned, right? Or is it the other way around? Forewarned is forearmed. That's what the correct way of the uh, of saying it is. So now that you have the knowledge in advance, you're able to actually avoid the problem. So the let's start here. The, 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 the biggest risk factors, there are a number of them, and I'm going to classify them by different types. So the first type is avoidant behaviors, right? And even within this, there are broadly two categories. The first is you actually know what you need to do. You know it. You don't like it. You, don't, you, know, you may not want to do it, but you know what you have to do, and yet you don't do it. And very often, these can be things like actually putting in the time required or very commonly not jumping around from one resource to the other, not abandoning things in the middle, right? Sticking with it till the end, even if you're really not having fun with it, but as long as it's moving you closer to your goal. Now, often the excuse will come up, 
hey, I don't actually know this is moving me closer to your, my goal. And you need to have the self-awareness to distinguish between an excuse and a reason. Often we use excuses and make them look like reasons. And all we're trying to do is avoid the situation. So avoiding behaviors, category one is knowing what you should do, but still not doing it anywhere. The second type of avoidant behavior is sticking within your comfort zone, which when you start to think about it is kind of evidence in the first one as well. How did this show up? It means that you don't want to learn something new because you're struggling with it, or you don't want to ask questions on Stack Overflow because you're worried about rejection, or you don't want to ask another coding friend that your friend who codes uh, because you're afraid of what their judgment will be with you. Or you don't want to announce to the world that, hey, this is my intention. This is what I'm going to do. Uh, you guys can laugh at me or think I'm crazy or encourage me. Whatever you do, I know that this is what I want to do and I'm going to do it. But that takes obviously a certain amount of courage and a certain amount of willingness to be outside your comfort zone. So if you stick within your comfort zone, what ends up happening is you only take the actions that you're already comfortable doing, but we know has not already produced the results you want. And if you keep repeating the things you already have done before, but expect a completely different outcome, you're going to be disappointed, right? So part of sticking or not sticking in your comfort zone is to take actions that you've never done before, even if they're deeply uncomfortable, and using that as a learning experience. And one way to think about that is there's an old saying, I, I don't fail, I, li I either succeed or I learn. Now, you may argue the semantics of that, but there's a very powerful message in there, which is your attitude to the outcome is what will determine the value of that outcome to you. You can either view to view, you can choose to view it as successful or a failure, or you can choose to view it as successful and a learning experience, or you can choose to experience it as, uh, or, ex or view something as just a failure, in which case you're very likely to put yourself in a negative emotional state and discourage yourself from trying again. Now, the other type, types of risk, risk factors are what I call the five underestimation, and there are five big ones. The first one is underestimating yourself. Typically, things like, I'm not good at math, I'm not good at this, I'm not good at that. The fixed mindset kind of stuff, which is an underestimation of yourself. I firmly believe that we're all human beings. We're all fundamentally the same. And we all have practically, for all practical purposes, unlimited intellectual potential if we put in the time and the effort, right? That's not true for everybody. I agree. But usually if you're kind of above average intelligence, or even if you're above, if you're just at average intelligence, you're still capable of as much as somebody who you would consider super high IQ, right? I see no correlation between that. And a lot of successful people are of pretty average um, intelligence. In fact, I dare, dare say that if you're a little bit honest with yourself, and I've thought about this a lot in my life, people who are less smart, either at school or college or, you know, whatever subject or less talented than you have possibly overtaken you career-wise or financially or emotionally or whatever, you know, metric you use. And that just goes to show that just having the raw talent, the ability is not enough. You need to uh, correctly um, align yourself with your goal and then just go for it and believe in yourself. So underestimating yourself is a major, major risk factor. The second is underestimating the path that you're going to be on. Like, look, I, re I remember I once went for a hike here in Australia and I did not read the weather forecast carefully and it was actually snowing on top of the mountain and I was in shorts. Now, as you can imagine, I was terribly underprepared for that, right? I had all the information I needed. I just didn't bother to look at it properly. I was reckless. I was actually careless. And so when I was there, I really suffered. <laughs> quite acutely. And so underestimating the path will cause a lot of problems, a lot of failure. And worse, in, in things like it's one thing to climb a mountain, it's another thing to to en endeavor on a thing like career change or learning a complex new skill that moves very fast, as coding moves really fast, is if you underestimate the path and you encounter problems that are expected, but you think they're not, <laughs> you're going to blame yourself. You're going to think you're not smart enough. You're not. You're not work. Hard, you're not cut out for it. You're never going to be able to compete. You're going to blame yourself, even though what you're going through is actually quite normal, right? Now, the third thing is underestimating the time it takes to get a mastery. Most people make the mistake of thinking, oh, "I'll learn a bit of HTML and CSS and some JavaScript, and I will then be employable." That's not true because the reality is that's like saying I know a little bit of English and so now I can go and be a judge, right? These are just the tools, the, the language, whether it's HTML, CSS, Java, JavaScript, Scala, whatever you want to call it, Python, whatever. It, these are just tools, right? And I've often said this on LinkedIn that your job is not to learn how to play a musical instrument, like using a musical metaphor. Your job is to know how to create music that people want. Nobody cares what instrument you use, really, at the end of the day. And so if you want to get mastery level, at a given instrument, it's going to take a lot of time. And to be employable, you need to have mastery level. You don't need to be the world's foremost expert, not at all. But you need to have a professional standard of skill. Without a professional standard of skill, why would anyone employ you to do this professionally, right? You're not an amateur. You need to be a professional level of skill. 
Now, the next thing is underestimating the competitive landscape, which kind of links in a bit with the previous point, which is you're competing with professionals. You may be at an amateur level, you can't compete with a professional when you're at an amateur level, right? So set the goal correctly. Don't underestimate the kind of time it's an effort it's going to take to get to professional levels of skill and then optimize to get there as fast as you can and do not underestimate the competitive landscape. As a career changer in my late 30s, I realized that most of my competitors were probably 10 to 15 young, years younger than me. My bosses were all going to be younger than me, which turned out to be true and still is. And so you need to understand that these are people who've been there 10, 15 years ahead of you, been coding for 10, 15, 20 years. Some of them have been coding since they were, you know, 13 or 14, and they're five years younger than you, or they were in my case. And there's no way I could actually expect to beat them in an interview. All I could do is be a better candidate, which is, you know, a completely different skill. So you have to correctly estimate the competitive landscape and realize that every day, hundreds of people with no background still get their opportunities, whether it's in coding or some other job or architecture or law, whatever it is, you know, people without experience get opportunities every day. So why not you? The question is not, is it possible? Of course it is because it happens hundreds of times every day. The question is, how is it? How do you make it possible for yourself, right? And you start by not making any of these five underestimations. Now, the sixth underestimation is the process of just de-risking yourself. And this is because and I, I banged on about this quite a lot on LinkedIn, is as, as candidates, our entire worldview is us, 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 us. It's a very me-centric worldview. I'm a candidate. I'm looking for a job. I want to be a coder. I'm trying to change my, my career. And the market doesn't really care, right? Because the market views you as one of many alternatives that it has to choose from. And there's a transaction. You give me your services and skill and I'll pay you, you know, X amount of dollars every year to do that, right? So that's what the market thinks about. You, on the other hand, are thinking, hey, I need a job. Hey, I've got to put food on the table. Hey, I've taken all this risk. Hey, I've got a family. Hey, I've got, you know, all this time that, that I could be spending in my other career. You're going through all that. So you have to understand that in the eyes of the market, a career changer is much more risky than someone who's not a career changer. Someone with no, no experience is way more risky than someone with a bit of experience. And so when you are presenting yourself to the market to try and change career and get a job as a coder, or in fact, any other career, you have to understand how you're viewed as a risk and then systematically de-risk yourself in the eyes of the hiring manager, right? And if you underestimate what that takes, no amount of learning code or algorithms and data structures is going to help you because you're still going to appear risky to the, to the person. And keep in mind, learning a lot of code doesn't help if you don't have a single interview. Right, it's like being all dressed up with no no date, right, to go with. So you want to make sure that you're not just learning to code, but you're also presenting yourself in the market in a way that makes you attractive to employers, and that's how you de-risk yourself in the market. Now, some of the other risk factors, we talked about this a little earlier, is the wrong expectations, right? Look, without setting the right expectations, you are going to experience what could be a normal friction or a normal setback or a normal failure as a very serious permanent sort of failure, okay? So in, in one of the previous videos, I talked about, you know, how to set goals, achieve the goals, chunk them down, right? So if you look at the video on, on, on how to do a when by learning go objective or learning goals, you know, when by is better than, you know, do by dates and stuff like that. In that video, I talked about chunking things down. So that's a good example of, how, of an opportunity to set the right expectations. When you chunk things down, you have to understand and set expectations with yourself about, you know, how long is this going to take? How much effort is it going to take every day? How's it going to feel when I'm struggling and I don't have any support and I'm, I can't understand something? And is that normal? Is that part of the process? It's like if you go, you know, to the gym for the first time in your life and no one tells you that your muscles are going to hurt, the next day, you're going to think you've done damage to yourself, right? And actually, no, that's a normal and healthy proof of the fact that you're on the right path is because you've got achy muscles the next day. But if you had no idea that was going to be the case, you would very legitimately expect that, hey, maybe I've injured myself permanently and you'd be afraid of the gym, right? So you have to have the right expectations. And one of them is also definitely not expecting recruiters to bang down your door just because you know some HTML or CSS or you know JavaScript or Java, or whatever. Like they're not gonna be banging down the door. Recruiters are looking for the best, most experienced candidate they can get for the least price. Okay, that's the nature of the marketplace. That's exactly what you would do if you went, you know, looking for a, a lawyer or an accountant or a teacher or a coach. You'd look for the best value you can get for the cheapest price. And that's exactly what hiring managers and recruiters are doing. So don't expect them to bang down your door. Instead, communicate your value right? So having right expectations on what each step of your journey feels like, even when you chunk it down, is absolutely critical. Now, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I know coding is meant to be hard. It's not easy. And they say it like an abstract concept. Yeah, of course, it's not easy. I don't expect this to be easy. Okay. Do you expect it to be hard? Yes, I expect it to be hard. But what does that mean? What does 
hard mean in practice? What is the actual day-to-day -day experience of doing something hard feel like? And typically it is, I don't know what to do next. I have no, I don't understand what I'm studying right now. My code doesn't work. This algorithm or data structure makes zero sense to me. I'm not able to communicate the solution. I cannot build an application. I don't even know where to start. I don't know if I'm in the right uh, direction. If only I had a plan. All of these pr things that you're going through are normal because that's frankly what happens when you do hard things. All these doubts happen, right? And especially self-doubt. Am I good, gonna be good enough? I'm not good enough in math. Am I gonna be able to smart enough, be smart enough to convince the hiring manager? All of that doubt, that emotional battle, the fear that you have to battle, that's kind of part of what hard things are. That is exactly what hard things are meant to feel like. That is what hard means, is that emotionally, intellectually, physically, certainty-wise, it's a very hard problem to solve. That's what hard means, right? So having the right expectation when you say, yeah, I know this is going to be hard, understand that that's really what it means for a long period of time, and you don't know when that's going to end. You honestly don't, right? You just have to keep going until you get closer. And, and you know, having the right expectations on time is also critical, right? We talked about in this in the, in the previous risk factor, if you have the wrong expectations about how long some things are going to take, you're going to switch. First thing you're going to do is you're going to say, this resource is not right for me. This person is not right for me. Uh, this language is not hard, right for me. Uh, this career is not right for me, etc. Things are going to take time. The, the challenge is, this is where it gets hard, is you don't know how much time is actually reasonable. Right. And so that's why taking having no wrong expectations about the time. I, my general rule is not just about coding, guys, about everything in life is you have a secret hope that it's going to take you X amount of time, triple it. And if you're not willing to do three to four times more time than how what you secretly hope it's going to be, don't even start because you're just going to give up. Right. But if you're willing to say, OK, I hope this is going to happen in, let's say, you know, two months. But if it doesn't happen in, in six months or if it doesn't happen in 12 months, then I know there's a problem. But if it doesn't happen in two months, OK, maybe I just underestimated, you know. So don't have these arbitrary deadlines. Make sure that you have the right expectations in terms of how long it's going to take. Right. The next one, really important these days in 2023 onwards. Do not go by social media and chat GPT. OK, neither of them are going to help you change career, nor are they going to help you learn to code. These are tools. Now, of course, this is going to be controversial. Can you learn how to do some things using chat GPT and some influence on social media? Sure. You can learn how to do something from anybody, right? Because you can always learn something. That's not the yardstick. The yardstick is, is this actually going to take you significantly closer to your goal such that Investing your time in it is a justified investment, right? Now, ChatGPT is just a big AI tool. It's just going to you know, do statistical averages and spit out responses. And I can tell you, I, I've been using AI in my coding job for over a year now, well before ChatGPT became a really big thing. And I can tell you, it is often wrong enough that I need to spend some time figuring out what to do with it. Or it's more right when I ask it a better question, which, by the way, is exactly what Google is like, right? It's just that it's, it's basically, ChatGPT basically, I would say, is a very advanced Google search right now. Now, in the future, it could do things um, that, you know, we currently can't do. And in the future, AI will replace fairly repetitive things, maybe, I don't know, you know, maybe like CSS or HTML or some, you know, data anal analysis. I don't know. It could replace any number of things. I actually think it's going to replace things in the medical profession, in the legal profession. Like, it's going to replace some things in a lot of professions. But that doesn't mean jobs are going to go. All it means is jobs are going to require slightly different skills. So jobs won't go down. Jobs which AI takes over may not exist anymore, but that's always been how it works, right? There was a time when you'd have chari charioteers around in the street all the time, and then you had chauffeurs, and now you just drive yourself, right? Like, that's just how things are. It's not that the jobs go away or the need goes away. It's that the nature of the skill will change. And that's where you can absolutely get an advantage is by being ahead of the curve in terms of what skills are going to be needed, right? So social media, chat, GPT, don't go by the expectations set by them. Here's my general rule. If somebody gives you a point of view and they haven't done what you're trying to do it's an opinion at best okay and advice can only come from someone who's actually done what you're trying to do everything else is an opinion so use that sort of mental model to figure out who to listen to online and chat gpt or whatever it is that you're using all right now uh, the other wrong expectation is that your recruiters are going to be interested in you just because you know how to code no, because frankly, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in every city that know how to code and who are also competing for the same job as you. So the way to get recruit interest is not simply to show that, hey, I've learned a little bit of, you know, HTML, 
JavaScript, CSS, Python, whatever. No, you got to get in a recruiter interest by showing that you're highly employable with the skills you have because you can solve real problems that the recruiter's client or the company needs to solve, which means you got to know a lot more about the company. And this is for career changes specifically. It's a different thing if you're coming out of uh, college and you have recruitment on campus or, you know, you've got some internships lined up and that's how you're going to get the job. That's different, right? Because they already know you. The hardest thing is getting the first interview. Not uh, Passing the interview is also hard, but what's the point of preparing to crack the coding interview if you don't have a single interview, right? So how to get interviews, how to get recruiter interest in a competitive marketplace is something that you should not have the wrong expectations about. It's hard. You're competing with people that look way better than you on paper. So the question is, how do you show value? How do you show you can do the job without doing the same thing that everybody's doing, right? You got to not just stand out, you got to stand apart. Like one of my recruiter friends, Dave, he, he mentioned this, stand apart, not just stand out, right? And there are ways to do that. You just got to figure out what works for you and get the right help in terms of the right guidance if that's what you need. Now, a common question I get is, and it's sort of linked to the expectation stuff, is how do I know this is going to work, right? How do I know this is going to work? Well, you, you don't. The short answer is you don't. You have. It's exactly like a business. You don't. You have a good hunch that the product's going to be great. You're going to be able to, you know, sell it well in the market, but you don't know. And typical, like any other startup, it's iterative. You try something, works, doesn't work, you get some feedback, you improve it the next time and you keep, you know, cycling through that. Now, there's a guy called Alex Harmozy, who, you know, is an entrepreneur that I followed for a few years. And, you know, I find him quite interesting the way he thinks. And like I said, most of the lessons I learned that helped me change code actually came from my startup and entrepreneurship years, right? It wasn't from the code. In fact, I got some of the worst advice I ever got from computer science folks or from people who'd only ever been in one career, which is coding. Like the serious, I did, you know, coding in, in college. I've been a professional coder for the last 10 years. Some of those sorts of folks, they didn't mean badly, but they just gave me some of the worst advice that I actually ended up receiving because they didn't know what career change is all about. Now, this guy is an entrepreneur. I was an entrepreneur in, in a past life. So I understand where this is coming from. And this is true of business. This is true of career change also, right? Generally, if a thing is not working, there are three reasons, okay? And you have, to know, you have to know which bucket it falls into. One is you're pursuing the wrong opportunity, right? A bad opportunity, whether it's business or the career. Like, let's apply this to coding. Well, coding is not a bad opportunity. We know that of all the jobs out there in the world today, it's probably going to be just like every other job, slightly affected by AI, but probably not that affected because every business needs tech. That's not going to go away, right? Every business is going to run on software. That's not going to go away, right? And so we know it's a great opportunity. We know there's plenty of potential, certainly more than most other careers out there. There's plenty of potential, okay, in my view. So we know it's not a bad opportunity. Okay, what are, what are the other reasons it could be failing? Well, you've got a bad plan or you're executing it really badly, right? So the right opportunity with a bad plan and terrible execution, it's just like the right business idea is not going to work. And the last thing is impatience, which goes down to having the wrong expectations. If you're being impatient, not giving it the time it's going to take, and it normally organically will take, you're going to think this is not working, when all it means is it's not working yet because it hasn't taken the time. Now, the analogy that a lot of people you know, would, would understand here is no matter how much you fertilize and water a seed, it's going to take a certain amount of time to germinate, become a plant, grow into a tree. Right, they, no matter how much you water it or fertilize it, it's not. You can't rush that process beyond a point. You can't skip the steps. It's kind of the same with career change. It's going to take the time it takes. Same thing with learning how to code to a mastery level or a professional level. It's going to take the time it takes. You cannot skip the steps. Being impatient is going to make you think you're failing. Right. So these are the three reasons. We know it's not. We know that coding is not a bad profession. We know that coding careers aren't really going anywhere. We know that with the right expect, uh, execution and plan, people like me and others have been able to make the change. And we know that impatience is another factor that's going to trip you up. So try and avoid each of these three factors. Factor one is not a real thing for you guys in in, in, in coding, but you know the, the next two, bad execution, bad plan, and impatience are very real things. Right, now... Let me talk, and I know I've been sort of uh, running through this quite fast, but the next thing I'd like to mention is that, that there are three currencies that we need to think about, right? Because there are really three currencies any of us have. We're all born with this in varying degrees, okay? All, all three, all of them. We're all born with some amount of it, but they're varying degrees, right? And so there are three investable resources or three currencies. One is money, the other is time, and the third is energy. Right, we all have these three. Think of them as three knobs on a music system, if you like, that you're dialing, like bass, treble, and volume, or whatever you want, right? And so these are three things that we have, all of us, in varying degrees. And we have to invest them. We cannot avoid it. Every single day of our life, we're spending or investing these three things in varying degrees, okay? Now, there's a big difference between a cost or an expenditure and an investment. An investment is something that'll 
has a reasonable likelihood of giving you some gain back. Okay, this is why a car is never an investment, right? It's always an expenditure because you're always going to lose money on a car once you buy it, and then it's always going to go down in value. However, it has a lot of value to you because it'll help you transport, but it's not an investment. Now, you can take education as a classic example of a really great investment. There, the jury's out there about whether traditional college education still is or not. But you know, I think most of us agree that having gone to some kind of college is probably better than not having gone to college. It may not have given us everything we wanted, but that could have also been wrong expectations or a wrong plan. But it's better that we we're educated than we're not. It's better to have some college degree or some high school education than to not, right? So those are also kinds of investments. Now, the three unavoidable ones, right? Money, time, energy. You have to invest these three, guys. You have to invest these three. And my suggestion is um, we always value the thing we have least, Right. Which is why, you know, people with plenty of money who are very successful businessmen or entrepreneurs or CEOs or whatever, they have lots of money and they don't have enough time. So they will spend a lot of money to save time. Right. They will spend a lot of money to save time. And, and you know, when, when people don't have money, they spend a lot of time to, to, to avoid having to spend money. Right. So that's just the way it is. So that's why some people can fly and some people will take the train. Right. It's one person has more money than time. The other person has more time than money. That's generally how it is. So there's a little bit of a dilemma, again, from the business world that comes in here. In general, and this is called the business dilemma, it's also true in software engineering project delivery, it's also true in most things in life, and definitely in career change, education, skill development, and so on. You kind of have to choose between three things, okay? Two out of three things, because you have those three resources, money, energy, and time. Now you have a, a dilemma. You can choose two out of the three things on the screen, right? You can It can either be good and fast, good and cheap, or fast and cheap. It cannot be all three. And so this means you have to choose how to invest your resources, right? If you want it good and fast, it's probably not going to be cheap. And, and you know, you can go through all the other combinations in, in this trilemma, right? So think about the resources you have in your uh, hands. Now, just because someone else went to computer science school doesn't mean you have to. Just because someone else taught themselves for free and took four years doing it doesn't mean you have to. Use the resources you have. Everybody has some resources that they have in some combination of these three, okay? Time, money, energy. Use the resources you have. Don't be afraid to invest all three if you need to, to get ahead and save, you know, save the time or save the money, whatever it is that you're saving, okay? If you're working full-time, then energy is also at a premium, right? Would you save, spend a little bit of money to save a bit of energy? Maybe. Right. That's what, exactly what you do anytime you take public transport instead of, ride, instead of uh, walking is you're spending money to save time and energy. Right. So use your three resources as best you can. You don't it, it, I'm not saying go crazy and you know spend all your time doing something and spend all your money. I'm just saying don't be afraid to spend the resources you have because everybody has these three resources in different points. Right. And you need to accept that there's a trade off. There's a very, very real trade off. Now, for example, I'm a big fan of free code camp. I, you know, learned a little bit of the basics of when I started out with free code camp. You know, I, I'm. I, I really have written a lot for free code camp because I really believe it's an incredibly valuable resource and all that. And it's free, right? It's very, very good. In my opinion, it's not necessarily the fastest way you can do. How do I know this? Because well, people choose to go to boot camps. In three months, they could do it probably faster if they were, you know, working part part time or full time. Now I have other views on boot camps and stuff because it may not work for everybody. But the point is, just because something is free doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing for you. Or inversely. Just because something is fast doesn't mean it's going to get you the result in a quality way. Or just because something is expensive doesn't mean it's going to be good. You have to figure out what's the right combination for you. Okay? Right. Choose two out of three, like I said. Now, there's one saying that this guy, Ben Franklin, once said, which really, really affected me. It's very, in fact, it drove a lot of my investments in my mid-30s in myself and education and getting better and self-development and stuff. And he said, if you think... Education is expensive, try ignorance, right? And it's really true. It's really, really true. We're so aware of the fact that, you know, things will cost us time, money, or energy, or things aren't easy. But think about this, not doing it is probably going to be much worse, right? So if you think something's expensive, whether it's time, money, or energy, or expensive in any other way, emotionally, whatever it is, then try not, think about what not having it is going to cost you as well, right? That's the main lesson from this thing. Now, let me quickly, quickly recap the major risk factors we've talked about. We've talked about the fact that hard things are really hard, and we really need to accept what hard actually means every day in granular detail on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Understand what that actually feels like in person. We've talked about the fact that if you know what to do, well, then maybe do it if you're not doing it, because often that's a classic risk factor. You, you know what action to take, but you don't take the action, 
right? And the other thing is you need to be living on the edge of your comfort zone, if not slightly outside it, not too far outside it, but certainly slightly outside it, because that's where the growth is going to happen. And that's where you're going to learn what you need to learn to expand your own horizons. Inside your comfort zone, you're not going to expand your horizons. All right. Next is we talked about the three different types of currencies, the investable resources that everybody has, which is time, energy, money, and everybody has them in different varying degrees. So invest what you've got heavily. Right? And don't hold yourself back from investing other things just because you think it's going to be hard, inconvenient, costly, you don't like to lose whatever it is. Really think about your investable resources and think like a CEO or an investor or a finance person and say, I've got these finite resources, I want to double my resources, how do I do it? Right. That's why people spend money to save a lot of time. That's why people go to college because they could do it themselves, but it's probably going to take them five years instead of three years. And that two years is you know worth two hundred thousand dollars to them or three hundred thousand dollars to them. So think about the cost of not doing something, not just the cost of doing something in terms of time, energy, and money. Your three big re investable resources. And the third is accept that no matter what choice you make, there are going to be trade-offs. Right. Be very clear on the trade-offs. Very very clear on the trade-offs so that you're emotionally comfortable with them when you make them. Right. If you're going to spend money for something accept that you're going to spend money and there's a risk that you may not get all that you hoped out of it. The question is, are you going to lose the money? Not really. You're going to learn something. It may not be everything that you hope for, right? Or you're going to spend, you're going to save the money, but you're going to put the dream at big risk because it could take five years and you could give up along the way. That's what I see happening most often. Or you could, you know, try and take a shortcut and say, I'm going to do, you know, this thing because somebody said I could do this in 90 days and I'm going to do that and I'm going to spend money and doing it in 90 days. And then you've, you, but you don't, aren't actually willing to put in the time and the energy. You're willing to put in the money and you're willing to, you know, go, go, let it go as fast as it, it'll go, but you're not willing to invest the time and the energy into it and you're trying to take a shortcut. Cut, that won't work either. So accept the trade-offs for everything you do. Right. So, you know, learn to tell the difference between ex expending a resource and investing it. And finally, remember that even though coding is a great career for many, you know, it, it's not that it, there's something wrong with the coding career if you're not making progress. So it's not that there's something wrong with you. It could be that you have the wrong expectations. It could be that your plan's not right. It could be that you're not executing the plan correctly. Or it could just be that you're being too impatient, right? I'm not saying it's easy to know. I'm just saying really think hard about which one this is because it's more likely to be that than the fact that you're not smart enough or that coding is not the right thing for you. Those are very rare, actually, to be honest. It's much more often the combination of wrong expectations, impatience, and bad plan. Okay, so that's it for the big risk factors. I'll see you in another video. Okay, welcome back. In this section, we're going to talk about some of the fundamental decisions that you have to make as you start your journey to code. Now, these decisions are quite important, but I do want you to understand that there are no perfectly right, universally accepted right decisions to be made. But there are wrong decisions. And when I say wrong, what I mean is that they're costly to you. Some decisions can cost you a lot of wasted effort, time, and money. And we want to avoid these things because they're sources of discouragement and demotivation. Keep in mind that this course is meant for people who have started their journey and also for those who've never even come close to coding before. So in this section, in the next bunch of videos, we will cover some fundamentals as viewed from the perspective of someone who has never touched code before. While I say these decisions are fundamental, the reason I say that is because they're just starting points and very important critical starting points on your journey to code. But don't be fooled into thinking that that makes them difficult. These are not intrinsically hard decisions, but they can be confusing. And that's why a lot of people get tripped up and frustrated by this process. And an enormous amount of energy and time is wasted on some of these fundamental decisions, which later prove to be irrelevant in the larger scheme of things. For example, we're going to cover fundamental things like choosing a programming language that's right for you. What is an IDE and which one should you try and use? Does it even matter? Or identifying skills that match your objectives so that you can be focused on what really matters, which is achieving your goal. Unfortunately, though, I cannot make these decisions for you, but I can give you the tools and insight that you need to make really smart decisions. Okay, great. Let's get started. The uh, Stack Overflow Insights page, which has the summary of the developer survey results from 2018, more than 100,000 developers told us what they enjoy, etc. So let's go down to technology, and it tells us, here we go, most popular technologies. Well, JavaScript's right up there. This is all respondents. Let's take a look at professional developers. 
Ah, that's also JavaScript. So you can see that web development seems to be, especially front-end web development seems to here too. The majority for uh, professional and coders generally, a lot of them seem to like these technologies and they're the most popular. Now that's probably just a sheer count, just the sheer numerical value of how many people want to do these languages. Let's see what's at the bottom of the list. Perl, not a very popular language. You know, Swift, Ruby, TypeScript, less somewhere in the middle. C++ appears to be more popular. Python's quite high. Java's very high. SQL, you know, a database. Now, you may not, you don't need to know all of these languages. That's really important to know. But what I'm trying to say here is you can reasonably infer that a really popular language is likely to have a lot of support around it. For example, a lot of easily accessible material. Now, Let's also look at it from the point of view of which language is popular from the industry's point of view, you know, from an industry demand point of view. So we can take a look at, well, top paying is one way to do it. Let's quick take a quick look at most loved, dreaded, and wanted, because I find that quite funny. So we see the most loved language is Rust. Um, the most dreaded language is Visual Basic. And these are interesting things to know, not necessarily directly relevant for your decision to choose a language. I'd go with the most popular technologies and then look at the top paying and see if that matches to your goals. If it doesn't, you need to have some real hard thinking about what matches to your goal. So in terms of the industry demand, which language is there a lot of demand for? One way to look at it is, well, which ones pay the top dollar for? So this could just be because there's a lot of demand for these, but not enough supply, but it may not be a general purpose sort of language. It could be quite specific and niche and therefore may not be suited to your learning goals. But it's interesting to see here that the top paying technologies are languages like F Sharp and OCaml, Clojure, Groovy, and Perl, which was you know not, not a favorite language, but quite in demand. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see <laughs> JavaScript, HTML, and CSS are, you know, not associated with the highest salaries. In fact, they're probably the lowest salaries. And the reason is there's probably a ton of supply in that area. Nothing wrong with that. It also means that there's probably a lot of jobs there, just may not be high paying jobs. So that looks at it from the demand point of view. Now let's have a think about how do we find beginner friendly languages? Well, there's not a great deal here that talks about that opinion. So I'll just go to Google and say, um, beginner friendly, oh, there you go, programming language. And we'll just start with this entry, which is just an excerpt that Google gives me, which talks about, well, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, what what else do they have at this Coda Dojo site? I'm just clicking on the first one that came up. So there's JavaScript, Python, Ruby, Java, not sure what Blockly is. Um, but these are really, apparently, they consider them to be uh, the top five programming languages. It's a bit dated, but I don't think too much has changed. It's fair to say JavaScript, Python, and Ruby, and Java are still very, very popular beginner languages. Uh, I think that's fair to say. So that's one way you could go about identifying, well, what's popular, what's not? What do you want to do? Try and map it to your goals, but have a really good think about making sure it aligns with your goals, because it's not, it's not important to go by what these stats say if it's not what you want. As you can see, the numbers that we just went through look quite a bit different. And I bring this up to prove a very important point. Just because a language is in huge demand in the industry, if it's one of the harder languages, then you're more likely to encounter frustration and give up. There is no point picking up a language that is in high demand if you're never going to complete it. So it is better to turn to that language once you have a robust confidence in your understanding of the fundamentals of programming in all languages. Now, unlike human languages, the second language in computing is always much, much easier than your first. Let me share with you my personal story so that you understand why I've come to this conclusion. When I started, I didn't analyze it this way because I did not have the benefit of this course. I decided I wanted to build an Android app for myself and not a toy app, a serious app. Eventually, I gave up and had some developers overseas build it for me. And even today, it's still on the Android Play Store. But I spent a little over four months trying to build an Android app with zero programming background, except for a little HTML. Now, maybe all of you are smarter than I was. Um, that's entirely likely. But this was enormously frustrating and a bad, bad set of decisions. So I gave up. It just felt impossible. 
and it kind of was. It was impossible given my level of knowledge. I knew nothing about the fundamentals of programming. Forget about the Android framework or Java. I just knew nothing about the fundamentals. And though I decided at that point of time that I better get to know Java a little bit, I found it extremely hard because I wanted to build an Android app instead of understanding programming through the language of Java. You see, I wanted to skip ahead skip the steps to the end goal rather than going through the steps. And so it took me months and months and months and months of getting lost and discouraged and confused. Now today, I'm good at JavaScript, not bad at Python and Java. But notice that they're all fairly beginner-friendly, solid, robust languages. But I went about it the hard way, the long and roundabout way. A few weeks ago, I happened to be asked to build a very basic React Native prototype, and I'd never done any React Native work before. But because I've invested so much in the fundamentals, I was actually able to understand the basics of React Native and knock together a prototype in two days because my fundamentals are strong. That was not possible for me a year and a half ago. It's taken a few years to get there. So what does this mean for you? As a total newbie to programming, what should you do? Well, what would I do? Today, I would recommend that you pick a beginner-friendly language, get very confident with its core programming concepts. It may happen that this beginner-friendly language takes you all the way to your goal. Languages like JavaScript and Python are very popular for that reason because sometimes they're all that you need to know for what you want to achieve. Both of these languages can now be used on the front end and back end, for example. That's full stacks. So most people can accomplish 90% of their coding goals, if not the entire 100% of their goals, with just one language. A second piece of advice from my personal experience would be to stay away from frameworks, and that includes things like React and Angular and Android and the iOS frameworks, until you feel your fundamentals are solid. It's better to be slow and get there than to rush yourself and burn out and never get there. Frameworks are not the same as languages. They, they require to have a fairly solid grasp of the underlying fundamentals before you apply the framework. In my example, using Android before I understood Java was a huge mistake. React 2 needs a solid understanding of JavaScript before you can understand how to work with it. Same thing with Django and Flask. They require an understanding of Python. These are just examples of what frameworks are and the underlying languages. First, learn the underlying concepts via the language before you move to frameworks. Once you understand a language, then a framework that's built in that language is enormously easier and definitely less frustrating to work with. Okay, but the question that then arises is, well, Zubin, how do I know my fundamentals are solid? Here's how I knew. This is the best answer I can give you, and I think it's a good one. Once you're able to read documentation and tutorials fairly fluently with enough speed that you're automatically familiar with the concepts you're reading without having to really rack your brains to figure out what's going on, then you know you've got decent fundamentals. If you can read code in other languages and have a decent idea of what's going on, then you're starting to get the hang of the core concepts and it's probably a good indicator that you're ready to keep moving to the next level. At that point, as we always must come back to your learning objectives and goals, at that point, look at your goals and ask yourself, what is the next learning objective? And now you just keep doing that, keep repeating that process until you achieve your end goal. Each step will take you forward. But start small and start with things that will give you that quick win that I keep talking about, keeps your confidence up, make sure it's measurable and frequently measurable, you know, daily or weekly mini goals and metrics, and keep moving onwards and upwards. Now, if your goal in the longer term is to find work as a developer, then be very specific about the kind of work and also the kind of employer that you're looking to join, because it's important to keep scanning their job boards to identify the skills that they keep recruiting for. And then that's your roadmap, just develop those skills. Later on in this section, in the next bunch of videos, we will talk about what it actually means to be a front-end dev and a back-end dev and a full-stack dev at various levels of depth. But for now, just know that you can't be an effective developer without understanding common... Okay, welcome back. In the last video, we talked about a very fundamental question around which type of language you should try and start with and how maybe that's the wrong question. In this video, we're going to start diving deeper into some of the other fundamental questions and some of the more practical aspects of starting your journey to code. 
In this video, we're specifically going to talk about the tools you need to learn to code. Now, I'm being very deliberate in my choice of words. I'm saying the tools you need to learn to code, that's not the same as the tools you need to be an effective and efficient programmer. To learn the fundamentals of programming, you need to use only those tools that contribute directly to making learning easier and quicker. Most tools in the development world will improve your efficiency or your convenience around coding, but not that many are actually necessary to learn to code. And that's a distinction I'm making in this video. So to learn to code, let's start at the first position, which is what sort of IDE should you use? An IDE is the short form for the Integrated Development Environment. Those are just fancy words for a code editor. You see, technically, even the notepad or Word software on your laptop is a code editor because all code is just text. You can edit code and you can write code in anything that edits text. Coding is just writing text. But most people prefer to use software specifically designed for programming activity, and there's a good reason for that. Now, these specifically chosen programming environments or software programs are more generally referred to as IDEs. You also know that Microsoft Word, for example, is better for texts and paragraphs, whereas Excel is better for numbers, though you can do either with Word or Excel. IDEs in the same vein are better suited for programming than just regular text editors. They can be configured and they are designed to give you output and feedback within the application. They may also often have useful features like debuggers, etc., all of which you will start to use down the track once you've grown a bit as a developer. There are many, many popular IDEs and you can really pick any one. You can pick Atom or Sublime or Visual Studio Code, which are some of the more popular free ones out there. And then there are paid ones like the ones that you can get as a professional from a company like, say, JetBrains. To learn with, though, I would suggest you just go with any one of the free or community edition ones. It doesn't matter. The important thing is to just pick one of the good popular ones and learn to use it well, which means you've got to pick it and stick with it. Keyboard shortcuts customizations, configurations, all these little helpers come along only when you stick to one application over a period of time. So sticking to one application actually helps you get very good at exploiting its features and getting really familiar with them. That's usually why people are loyal to one over another. It's not because one is necessarily hugely better than the other. It's just that switching to an unfamiliar one is a huge loss of productivity when you haven't got it set up properly. And setting up an IDE and configuring it to your working style and preferences can take a little bit of time. Again, that's not something you need to do right up front. You do that organically, naturally over a period of time as you learn to code. Some IDEs are specifically needed for the kind of work you intend to do. For example, if you want to build an Android app, you're probably best off trying to use Android Studio. And if you want to build um, iOS or Mac apps, you're best to use Xcode. Now, again, we're jumping a bit ahead of ourselves, but this is just to give you context as to the different kind of IDE environments available. If you're interested in data science, that's another example, then there are IDEs like Spider, which are designed specifically for that. Um, but you wouldn't want to use Atom or Sublime for that necessarily. You can, but a lot of people would prefer not to because Spider is more fit for purpose. Also, and this is something that's relatively recent as a development and fast becoming my favorite go-to um, environment is online IDEs because they're often integrated into your training platform or you can just get them free on, through a browser. Now, if you've ever been to Free Code Camp, for example, online, which is a free coding school, um, you would see that they actually have an inbuilt IDE in the browser for you to practice. The same thing goes for Code Academy and a bunch of others. Another fantastic in-browser IDE for quickly prototyping or practicing or solving a simple functional problem, um, which I personally use and love, is called repl.it. That's R-E-P-L.it. Now, I should say I'm not 
promoting it or you know I don't get anything for this it's just that I found it very very useful um, along with others like code pen which are also extremely extremely useful many web developers do use code pen and ripple.it and js fiddle to do little snippets and practice these are typically referred to as online playgrounds and they're very good for prototyping small pieces and sometimes even showcasing your work. You can actually build fairly sophisticated applications with them, but it's generally not the way you'd end up going because you have less control over how your code's visible to the world. Now, if I didn't want to download an ID and I'm just learning fundamentals, I would probably save myself a lot of the initial setup friction and just use something like a repl.it or CodePen or something for the first few weeks anyway. And after that, once I get comfortable with that, I may take out a day or so to install a proper ID in my laptop and set it up. But that's just my personal preference. The important thing, like I said before, is for you to pick something that you find it easy to work with and rewarding because it gives you quick feedback and stick to it as you will get more and more familiar and adept with it over time. Okay, so let's move on from IDs for just a moment because a lot of people also get caught up with things like version control, which is often popularly referred to as Git. Um, and the other area people can sometimes get stuck on is knowing how to use terminal or Windows commands and things like bash and terminal scripts and shell, etc. Now, all of these skills, and I'm not going to go into too much detail because these skills are very useful and valuable for a programmer, but they're not necessary for a beginner to learn. In fact, I would think that they can be a little bit arcane and sometimes tough to comprehend, and it's the kind of thing that'll just overwhelm you. For a beginner, don't worry about things like version control for the first several months. Don't worry about things like, you know, writing things in the terminal and these strange looking um, boxes with lots of text that make no sense. Forget about all that. Don't let that distract you. Just learn the fundamentals of programming. If you're finding that you're doing stuff in the terminal, for example, and that you're lost, all that means is that you've jumped a few steps ahead. So you're using a resource that's probably not designed for where you're at at your level. A well-written well tutorial will always guide you through using all the aspects that they're talking about, but often they presume certain prior knowledge, and if you don't have that prior knowledge, you're going to feel overwhelmed. Okay, so in this section, we've answered the question, what minimum tools do you need to learn to code? And I've tried to draw the distinction between what you need to learn and what you need to be an effective programmer to encourage you to take it step by step and only focus on those minimum tools you need to get started with learning the fundamentals of programming computers. Great. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Okay, welcome back. In the last video, we talked about the sort of tools that you need to start learning the fundamentals of programming rather than tools you just need as a programmer. In this video, let's talk about something a little bit harder to grasp and perhaps a lot more subtle, but very practically important to what you want to do. And that is how to identify and choose which skills you need to acquire. I want to emphasize here, I'm not talking about what you want to have, not what skills you want to have, but which skills you need to have. And that's only possible by reference to the goals and plans exercises, which I'm sure you've done a couple of times now. Though that exercise should have helped you identify what skills you need to develop to meet your specific learning objectives. Now we need to break those broad goals down or those learning objectives down into smaller discrete sub goals each of which have a clear completion point that is a point when you know you've achieved that sub goal let's use examples of some popular goals to help you understand what i mean by choosing the right skills at a sub goal level so a lot of people for example want to be front end developers or back end developers or full stack engineers Front-end means that they handle the stuff that the end user sees and interacts with. Back-end means that they handle the stuff that the user doesn't directly interact with, but which is necessary for the front-end to deliver a certain user experience. Let's take an example so you understand this. Let's take an example like a blog site. The front-end is where people can read blogs and scroll through them and click on them and write and edit them. But when they read, write, or edit things, they're actually consuming creating 
and modifying data, right? I mean, a blog is basically just data. That data needs to be saved somewhere. It then needs to be retrieved from that storage place. And if it's being edited, it needs to be edited and saved and records kept and so on. So the storage and retrieval is on the back end of the application because that is not what the user sees or interacts with. But what they see in the browser is the front end. A full stack developer is able to handle the coding for the front end as well as the back end. Now, if you want to be a front end dev, then don't start learning about back end stuff. Choose skills you need for front-end, mainly skills like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript as the programming language. For back-end, maybe you want to do it in Java or Python, or even JavaScript. For full stack, you'd need that and more, like learning about database design and technologies. Even if you want to be a full stack developer, just start with small goals. Start with the front end, know a bit, bit about that. L learn a bit of HTML and CSS and then some JavaScript. Then you can move on to things like Node.js for the back end and some other back end language like PHP or Python. What my point is here is that it's important to learn to separate the advanced skills from the beginner skills. And that's often hard to do because there are a million different opinions. People just tell you, oh, this is what you want to do. This is what you need to know. But you need to separate them out into stages of skill. So a good way to do this constructively is to speak to your mentor or others who've done what you're planning to do. People who walked down this path before can give you a better map. A useful approach for yourself in your alone time is to ask yourself, is this particular sub-goal necessary for me to learn next? Or is it just desirable? This is the want to versus need to question. Is there something else that I need to know more than this? In other words, prioritize your skill acquisition in accordance with what you need to do next. And there is always one thing, not two or more things that you need to do next. Always boil it down to the one right next thing. Your top priority can only be one thing, otherwise it's not your top priority if it's shared with other things. That's the only way to be effective when you're learning. An unhelpful question is, should I know this, or will this make me a better coder? Chances are, the answer to both is yes, in order to achieve your long-term objective. But that's not going to help answer the question of what's immediately next as a sub-goal. So that's what causes the confusion and the decision making is so hard. It's because you ask a slightly different question, which gives you a discouraging answer. When you focus on the question of what comes next, make sure it's literally what comes next. Do I need to know this next? Can I get to where I want to be without knowing this? Is another way of eliminating what doesn't come next. So sorry to harp on about this, but it's really, really, really important to avoid the temptation to jump too far ahead. Don't be stupid like me and, and try to go from zero to Android developer in a week or a month. You, you know, you just cannot get to the 10th floor of a building without going up the stairs or walking up the elevator, whatever it is. Unless, of course, you're Chuck Norris. Step by step is my advice, and there is always one step that comes next. Now, you may be able to see three or four steps. Don't try to do them all. Don't leap them all. Just do the one steps. It does take a little work to figure out what the next step is, and you know, you'd probably get it wrong the first few times. That's okay. You're still building your intuition around this. So that's also why I've designed these lessons for you to keep coming back to, because the more you come back to them for a quick refresher, the better you'll be at making judgment calls like what's next. The whole point of this, this class and this course is to guide you through these inevitable moments that come up time and time again. Okay, let's keep moving because there are more videos to be done. Welcome back. In the last section, we went through a number of videos um, where we helped to work through the fundamental decisions that anyone who's new to programming needs to go through in order to be effective in their learning journey. In this section, we're going to start looking at some of the strategies, what I call open secrets, um, that make people effective learners. Now, I've 
been using dozens of learning strategies to become what I would consider to be a super learner over the last 15 plus years. And I've taught myself a number of things and also learned professionally through a number of uh, sources. And I know that you can actually boil down a lot of the learning strategies for coding specifically to just a handful of them. And that's what I've done in this section. I've taken all the learning strategies I know of, experimented with a whole bunch of them, and reduce them to a few so that you can use them in order to identify which ones really work for you as you learn to code. Um, many of these strategies aren't specific to coding, but I've tried to make them about coding so that it's easier for you to contextualize them. And the reason I call them open secrets is because actually everyone knows them. It's just that either they don't know they know them or they're just not willing to apply them, but that's the secret that you've got to apply. So in this section, we're going to talk about some ways to learn new skills very fast, as fast as possible, really, while growing your core competence. So it's not just about learning things very quickly and then not being competent in them. It's really important that you retain competence. Um, in terms of the sources for a lot of these strategies, I picked them up from the education sciences, from my study of psychology and meta-learning, um, and even the experience of other super learners like Tim Ferriss, etc., have been really useful to validate some of the strategies. Look, I'm really excited about this section, so let's not waste any more time and let's jump right in. I'll see you in the next video. Now, a very quick update for me in 2023, at the end of 2023, um, this used to be true that I'd learn most on videos, but it's actually no longer true on the job for me anymore because it's, as I get more senior and experienced, um, a lot of the prerequisite knowledge is already in my possession in, in circumstances where I'm working with things I'm somewhat familiar with and have the right intuition. And so it's actually much easier for me to now understand what the doc documents mean, what re you know, written resources are trying to tell me, I'm able to pass through that information much quicker simply because I'm a bit more experienced compared to, you know, four or five years ago. However, there are still some topics, um, especially brand new topics, or just topics that I'm trying to learn entirely for fun of my own growth, where I typically still will start with videos because personally, I find videos the most efficient way. It's There's a lot of words that you don't have to deal with when you can just watch somebody do it, right? Visual media are much more rich. So I still use it. But on the job, I find more often than not, I'll do a very quick Google search, a Stack Overflow search, a ChatGPT search, whatever it is, find the text, reason about it, go to the documents, find my way through the documents. And it's actually much faster than trying to find which video is the right one for me, because sometimes videos can be hours long, right? So it's actually much more efficient this way. So you will notice too, as you get better and more adept and more familiar with things, um, your, the, your chosen medium for finding the solution that you need in that moment will change depending on what, how much time you have, what your goals are, what your objectives are, and what your favorite method of learning is. Okay, in the last video, we covered the first open secret, which we call the minimum effective dose. In this video, we're going to talk about a big and very important secret, secret number two. Now, you do remember from the introduction to this section that I did caveat that these secrets aren't really secrets at all. I mean, they're open secrets. So I want you to remember that. Um, and I'm calling these a secret because everyone wants to know what the special sauce is in the recipe for success, but they already know what it is, and yet they think it's something else. In fact, you probably already guessed what secret number two is, because everyone knows actually what it is. And sadly, it's not glamorous. The secret, secret number two, is practice. That's it. Hey, I did warn you that it wasn't going to blow your mind, but... You know, practice is so completely underrated. And maybe it would blow all our minds if we just saw how much practice goes into excellence and what what incredible things we can achieve by just following this secret. I don't know. That's just what I believe. But I'll tell you what, let's dig into it. Hey, did you guys know that Benjamin Franklin used to study his favorite authors? This was back when Ben Franklin was training himself to be an author. He would study his favorite authors, and I don't mean just study his authors. He would actually pour over their books and writings, then put them away, and for days on end try and reproduce those writings himself by trying to imitate, imitate the bits of them he really liked. That's an enormous amount of work. I mean, Benjamin Franklin effectively practiced being the authors that he admired. That is an enormous amount of commitment. The reason why I think this is still a secret, this practice concept, is because all of us have a natural tendency 
to want to avoid the one thing that works, which is practice. The secret is that it is actually guaranteed to work. Practice will 100% get you to the level you want. It may take you more or less time than someone else. That's almost irrelevant, to be honest. And maybe it'll take you more effort or a little bit less effort. Really depends on what your inherent skills are. But you can't avoid the fact that practice is the only thing guaranteed to get you the results. Okay, enough preaching about the big secret. The real question for you to make this practical is... What are the effective forms of practice when it comes to learning to code? Because that's what this course is all about. So I will share with you, through my extended period of experimentation and trial and error, the principles I've learned about effective practice when it comes to programming. Number one, programming requires different skills to come together, and it's important to keep in mind that each of the skills need practice. So two is about getting more specific. You're learning fundamental programming concepts. We talked about this in the fundamental decision section. You're learning how to program a computer. For this, you need to practice things like syntax of your chosen language and the way in which you structure a small code statement, how you declare a variable, how you may need to keep in mind what sort of data is represented by that variable, and all these little things. All these little things matter and they get better, they become more natural for you with practice. You know what? The famous joke about coding is how a semicolon can crash your code. It's true. So even putting in semicolons in the right place where the language requires, it does matter. The more you do, the more fluid you become. It becomes like a second language. The more fluent you become in writing those basic statements. But initially, it takes time. So you, you need to practice with patience. The third principle I can share with you is that as you practice more and more complex chunks of code, Say, for example, you're asking a user for a little input, maybe their age, and then you want to add 10 to that age and tell them that in in 10 years, they're going to be X years old, right? Age plus 10. Now, that requires practicing slightly more complex levels than just the initial stages. It's basic conditional logic. It's, okay, if you're this many years now, in 10 years, you will be doing, you will be this many years, which means you're X plus 10 years, which is a mathematical operation, but there's also an if statement there. So to do these patterns of code, which are absolutely the building blocks of a program, you have to learn the habit. It's, it, it'll feel strange at first, and it takes time. So these patterns and routines take practice. So you start off with the basics, then you move into these small little code patterns and chunks. And that'll then take practice, even though the easier bits now start to feel like second nature. All right, the next principle is, as you're building up in complexity, you'll need to really start to practice how to Google the right questions to get the right answers. Now, people may not appreciate this, but about 90% of the time you spend writing code is actually spent researching the best way to do it. Um, that could be the most efficient way to do it or the correct answer for something you're not really sure how to do. So make Google your friend. It's one of the best friends a developer can have. And Googling the right thing is very important so that you get the answer as soon as you can. Initially, I didn't even know what was going wrong, so my Google searches did take me to the answer. Now, I have developed a really good intuition. I can see what's going on, I can see the error, and I can in my head calculate, okay, it looks like this is what's going wrong. I just don't know how to fix it quite yet, and so I can go in and Google. It's a huge part of a coder's workflow, make no mistake. Googling is a massive part of what you do as a coder. So reading through resources like Stack Overflow or Wikipedia or the documentation, takes practice too, and that gets better the more you understand how the language is working or the framework is working. The more you understand what you're doing, then when you read the advice you get, it all just makes sense almost effortlessly over time. So you may ask for sauce, but if you know specifically you want Tabasco, that helps a lot, right? That's, that's an example I can give you of how Googling specifically will give you a much better response than just asking for sauce. Okay, so that covers some of the big principles, and you can see there's a chronology to it. Each builds on the complexity that went before it. Now, let me assure you, these skills take time and practice. And I'm, I've hopped on on this also in the course, that it's not something you can do in a month or two or three. Well, maybe you can, but I wouldn't expect that. Initially, when you try to read documentation, it's going to overwhelm you and probably throw up many more questions than, than the answers. 
um, that's okay. That's actually a signal that you may have jumped ahead. So step back a bit, go back a few steps to the level that feels right for you and slowly work up from there. An example I can give you of this principle is when I was younger, I taught myself how to play the guitar. Today, I'm pretty good at it, but when I first started, I first had to learn how to press the strings right to the guitar. And then if the guitar was out of tune, I had to actually learn how to tune the guitar so that playing it actually made sense. So it was so painful. It hurt my fingers. And, you know, I think, oh, I'm going to try and learn this tune today, but it would take me one week to learn it and not just a few hours because there was so much that I had to learn to even get to a point where I could play a tune. It's the same principle with coding. It, it just seems to take forever at first, but that flywheel just keeps turning faster and faster the more you practice it. So practice, practice, practice. Be patient, practice, practice, practice. I know I've said practice a lot of times this video because I want to drive the point home. I would recap this section, but I think I've made the point abundantly clear. You'll never know whether there's enough practice, but you will know whether you're being fluid. And if you're not fluid, then you could use a little more practice. That's the rule of thumb I go by. All right, so don't skip the step, but let's move ahead to secret number three. Okay, welcome back. In the last video, I revealed to you the earth-shattering, jaw-dropping, life-changing, cosmos-quaking secret of practice. In this video, I'm going to share with you something maybe a little bit more down-to-earth. We're going to call it secret number three, and the secret really is that you don't need to learn only from experts or from people online. You can learn from your peers and others who are at a similar stage or maybe even who are slightly behind you. And so I call this secret two is greater than one because really what it's saying is you don't have to do it alone and doing it with somebody else can take many forms, which we'll talk about shortly, but doing it with other people is a very good way to embed the knowledge in your head. But it's not something you want to do too early in your journey. So my personal suggestion is maybe don't do it in your first four to eight weeks. Just concentrate on yourself and building your first layer of fundamentals. And then after that initial phase, start to involve one or two other people in your journey to code. Now, when I say involve others, there are three ways that I would recommend you do this. You don't have to do all of them or you can do all of them or choose the ones that work and are convenient for you. Okay, so the three ways I would recommend you do this are, number one, read the code of others. From tutorials or even just GitHub, it's great, but try and read the code of others, especially on GitHub. Um, over time, you'll learn a lot. Maybe not initially, it'll feel like a real struggle, but as your knowledge grows, your ability to read other people's code and know what's going on will improve. And so that will teach you not just how to do things, but also how not to do things. You'll learn either they've done something better or they've done something that doesn't work as well as something you worked at. All great learning. Some of the neatest tricks I learned was from reading other people's code, thanks to the open source movement, right? So get involved with the open source movement if you like, if, if you feel comfortable, and you don't have to intimidate yourself by thinking you need to build an, an entire app on your own. That's not what open source necessarily means. You can start really small by just offering to write their documentation a little better, which is often an overlooked part. People are so busy focusing on the code that they don't write great documentation or the documentation is not beginner friendly. As a beginner, you know how to make it beginner friendly. So that's how you can get started by contributing. Reading other people's code is actually really valuable when you need to use libraries and chunks of other people's code or in a professional environment where you probably get a job in a place where you're not writing something from scratch, right? You'll have to work with other people's code. So getting the hang of reading code is really important in a professional environment. Okay, number two, another way to make it a little more collaborative or social um, and involve others is to teach what you're learning. A lot of people have done an incredible job writing little tutorials or blog posts telling others how to do something, but the reason they're writing it is because they've just learned or they're in the process of learning how to do that. Even I did that. Um, I maintained a small and, and not periodically updated, it was fairly infrequently updated blog, um, but summarizing the key principles that I'd learned. Part of it was to document for myself so that I could always come back and have a quick reference guide to building something or a piece of, you know, or a functionality, but also as a way to force myself to bring these 
concepts into words that are comprehensible to other people, which then builds your ability to communicate technical things. That's a really, really important skill, right? The ability to communicate your technical concepts, to translate them from your idea in your head to uh, something another coder can understand is a vital skill, especially at the workplace if you want to be a professional dev. If someone asks you a really great question and you don't suddenly know the answer to that, that's a really good sign that, hey, you know, your learning could, could get even better in that subject. So you, you just tend to learn by teaching. The opportunities to teach others are actually more common than you think. You can teach people at work, you can teach people at community programs, you know, you can write, like I said, essays, blogs, and contributing to open source. So there's actually a lot of ways in which you can teach others and help share the knowledge. Technique or method number three is pair programming, which is quite common in the development world, especially in the educational scene, but also as part of training given at work um, where, you know, developer teams are encouraged to pair program. And this is because it really, really does work. The concept is you and someone else will take turns at programming. One person is the driver, which basically means that they're going to be actually typing out the code and you know writing it out into the IDE. And the other person is the navigator, who's the person who's doing the thinking and trying to articulate their thinking in language that the, that the driver can understand and type into the IDE. So the effect of this is that it teaches you to communicate technical concepts while collaborating with others and developing the empathy to know how to express an idea that's in your head in a clear, concise way that somebody else sitting next to you can immediately implement it. Now, you do switch quite often. So, you know, you may do 15 minutes, 20 minutes as the driver and then take over as the navigator and you switch back and forth. Um, and if you can do this, it's a really valuable skill at the workplace. Sometimes maybe your mentor or your model, if you happen to know them or have access to them, um, can, can do this with you and train you up. So if you do it with someone who's a lot better than you, there's a great deal of learning. But even if you do it with someone your level or slightly behind you, that's fine too. You don't need to do it in physical proximity with each other. So in this modern day and age, we can do this online. You can use Hangouts or Skype or whatever it is and a screen share and write code in real time with each other and collaborate that way. All of these three techniques are really, really, really helpful at bedding down the knowledge that you've developed. Um, as some of you may know, repeating what you've learned with a bit of spacing in between is a highly effective technique of making sure you remember longer. And one great way of repeating it is by having to teach someone else. Okay, so that's secret number three, which is two is greater than one. And I will now see you in the next video. Okay, welcome back. In the last video, we talked about secret number three, which is how two is greater than one. In this video, I'd like to talk to you about the reality of coding, which really is quite intellectually demanding. And along with being intellectually demanding, it's also quite emotionally demanding and can be quite draining. And the reason for that is you spend a lot of your time, especially in, in the initial part of your journey, you're going to spend a, a lot of your time being confused and frustrated, uh, dealing with a lot of setbacks, um, and that can be quite hard. So secret number four, which we're going to talk about in this video, is going to be quick it sounds trivial, but it's really, really important because it does set you up for success. The only thing is it's kind of hard to remember to do it when you're in the thick of coding. So secret number four is called pace yourself, and it's really important. When I say pace yourself, I really mean two things. One, I recommend you follow a process where you learn something in a finite amount of time that's not too long, and then you take a short break for something else then return. I do not recommend that you do marathon sessions, even though that's what it looks like is normal in shows like Silicon Valley and stuff. I personally follow the Pomodoro technique, which is a proven way to keep your learning resilience and retention up. I can add more links for you in the, in the, in the notes to this lesson. Second thing I'd recommend you do, do when it comes to pacing yourself is to learn when to walk away. Now, this sounds really quite silly, but it's actually really important. Getting stuck when you're coding is a very normal and sadly very common and inevitable part of coding.
Coding is just one of those things that can consume your focus completely. But the problem with that is that our focus gets narrower over time, and so does our ability to think laterally and creatively solve problems. Over a single session that extends for too long, you'll find your cognitive capacity is declining. So when we don't solve our problems, we'll get frustrated. We then feel angry and we want to give up. And we want to avoid a situation that discourages us that much, right? So rather than exhausting ourselves over long sessions, I recommend getting up quite frequently, doing a little exercise, walking the dog, meditating, listening to some music that improves your state. Uh, you know, do things that switch your emotional and mental state. And these are all proven techniques to resetting yourself mentally. Now, I should warn you that when you're in the thick of coding or you, you feel you're on the verge of a breakthrough or you're really stuck and it's really annoying you that you're stuck, it'll really feel like you cannot possibly step away from that problem at that moment. You're, you're going to feel like that's the worst time to walk away. It's so hard to do when you're deep in code. I, I accept that. I recognize that. I struggle with this pretty much every day, really. But I have found out almost universally that when you walk away from the problem, especially when you're coding, somehow it gets solved subconsciously. And when you return back to the problem, you tend to solve it much faster or you attack it from a new angle that only could have occurred to you when you released the problem for a while. I've made the opposite mistake on several occasions, right? I made the mistake of breaking my own rules and coding for four hours straight or something and then getting massively stuck in the second hour. And then I lost the other, other two hours because I just stubbornly refused to step back and give it some breathing room. And then I come back later on and the solution actually took me 10 minutes. So I recognize the concentration is very hard to break, but concentrating for a long time with great discipline on the wrong thing doesn't mean you're going to find the right solution. So take a break, have a Kit Kat, do something completely different and come back. Just as a completely interesting side note, and this is not so much of educational value here, but there is a phenomenon that you should watch out for when you code very intensely. What happens is you, you can tend to start dreaming of code, and it can actually impact your sleep. Now, I personally have gone through this several times. I still go through it when I code too late into the night and then go straight to bed. And after a few days of this, I'm pretty useless. It's just that your brain hasn't shut down properly. If you're curious about this, this phenomenon is sometimes called the Tetris effect. And I've added some links in the notes to this lesson as well. So just keep in mind to recap that mental tiredness is a very normal part of really getting into code. Coding is very addictive and incredibly absorbing. And that's what's fun about it. That's what's so rewarding about it. But that's also what's so exhausting about it. And so it makes it doubly important that to sustain yourself, you need to pace yourself. And that's what the secret number four is. Pace yourself so you can be resilient and bounce back. Keeping these things in mind will make you much more effective in managing yourself on your journey. And we know that better self-management means you'll achieve more goals, which means you'll be more successful. All right, that's it. I will see you in the conclusion to the section now. All right, guys, congratulations. You've reached the end of yet another section, and you are making such great progress. You're going at such a great pace that you're going to be done very, very soon. In the last section, we talked about the open secrets, as I call them, that um, help you learn to code very effectively. And so now I think you're ready to actually go into the next section, which is going to cover some of the setbacks that many people do encounter. I hope you don't, but it's very possible that you will. And I hope to take you through some techniques that I found incredibly effective at dealing with those, with those setbacks constructively and effectively. So... You should be really proud with, with the progress you're making. With every passing video, you're getting so much closer to your goals. Um, and I hope you're feeling good about that. So take a short break and I'll see you in the next video. Welcome back to the next section. Now, all the videos in this section are designed to help you prepare mentally. We're going to make sure that you have a really, really solid, unbeatable mindset. Why is mindset so important? It's because the quality of your thinking when confronted with certain problems is what's going to help you see your way through those problems or your hard times. And by definition, hard times are really hard because setbacks and failures and doubt are really difficult things to deal with. The coding journey is filled with these setbacks and it's filled with these negative 
experiences. So it's very, very easy to quit. It's hard to persist and very easy to quit. But how you think about it, your mindset, is going to be the difference between persisting and quitting. And that is the difference between achieving your goals and failing. Because failure only really happens when you stop trying or when you quit. And as you know now, my goal and the goal for you in this in this entire course is to do everything we can to make sure that you don't get discouraged or let the failures cause you to quit. We need to make sure that you don't give up so that you achieve your goal of becoming a coder. If you were an athlete, for example, Mental conditioning would just be as important as the physical conditioning. You would be trained to handle your emotions when you're playing what seems to be a game without any hope. If you look at champions in the sporting world, they're usually someone who overcomes the odds and fights the battle when it seems hard to win. Winning easy games is is not the mark of a champion. Fighting back the setbacks with a great attitude is what makes the champion. We see this all the time in the sporting world. So why shouldn't it be the same for coding? I firmly believe that if we train for our learning objectives like we would train for a sport, we would get fantastic results. Instead of a physical marathon, just think of this as training for an intellectual one. There's no real difference. This intellectual marathon is also filled with setback and confusion and doubt and failure. And there are certain common themes that have emerged from my experience and my research into how people experience their journeys to learn to code. This section takes those most common themes and trains you to recognize them, to see them for what they are, to deal with them and not be tripped up by them. So you've made it this far, which means you've got what it takes to be a champion for this intellectual marathon. So let's keep going and I'll see you in the next lecture. All right. One of the first setbacks I think anyone who's learning to code is going to encounter is that sense of complete and utter confusion. Things just don't seem to make sense initially, right? There are all sorts of competing words and inconsistent terminology, concepts that you're reading about even at at a beginner level that just do not make sense. You cannot understand them. You don't know exactly what they're trying to say. And your brain really feels overloaded by the information because you're not just reading, trying to read and understand. Each word in that has a specific meaning. And so your brain is really working hard to fully absorb the meaning of every word or every sentence, while at the same time trying to stick to the overall concept that's being communicated. You are definitely not alone. The problem is not many people talk about this which is why I'm doing this video. So the sense of total and utter confusion is normal and possibly even inevitable. Often, and this is where I want you to really think about it, often it's also a signal. It could be a signal, for example, that maybe you skipped a step somewhere. And maybe it's not always the wrong thing. Skipping a step is only the wrong thing if it wastes your time, energy, and money, or if, or if it frustrates you so much that you feel like quitting or are discouraged from continuing. So if you're feeling confused, the first thing to ask yourself is, why am I in this position? Why am I doing something that is confusing me so much? What's the reason for this confusion? Could it be that the resource is not right for me? Could it be that I've jumped too far ahead? The second reason is much more likely. If you're feeling discouraged and frustrated, it's usually reason number two because reason number one just makes you go find a better resource. Once you are confident and have strong fundamentals, reason one stops being a reason. It actually stops causing frustration or fear or at least happens much less often. With experience, you learn to recognize reason one so well that you immediately correct your course of action. But initially, reason number two, which is that you've jumped too far ahead, can cause all sorts of doubts and emotional reactions. And that's why it's such a dangerous setback for many people. So the best way to tackle this is to assume that you've driven into some sort of dead end, some dead end alley. So reverse your car back up and go back to the last resource that you were really comfortable with. That is, the last learning that you felt you had mastered. 
it should be the learning objective immediately before this dead end that you've gone down. Then once you get there, ask yourself, what is a smaller next step than the one that I previously took that got me all confused? If you look carefully, you will see a smaller step that'll get you there. Typically, the confusion happens when you try and jump over three steps at a time rather than just the one next best step. And really, that's all you need to do. Now, it may sound frustrating that you have to do that and you may think it's going to take you more time, but I promise you, taking a smaller step and not getting stuck is much faster than trying to leap prematurely to a bigger step and falling down a hole. It's important to build up slowly into the lesson that got you confused so much. Now, I totally respect and understand that we're all impatient. But if you're in a hurry to get someplace, the quickest route is always the one you know you can navigate rather than the random experimental route that looks shorter but you have no idea what it's all about. For now, let's recap quickly. Being confused and lost is common and it's simply a signal that you've jumped a little bit too far ahead. Assume that you could have gotten to this point by taking slightly smaller steps, so go back and give yourself smaller, quicker wins. It may take you a little more time, but in the long run, it takes a lot less time when you don't get stuck and confused. Okay, I'll see you in the next section. Okay, welcome back. In the last video, we talked about one of the most common setbacks, which is the feeling of absolute and utter confusion. In this video, we're going to talk about something related and just as common, but very, very different at the same time. It's the sense of being completely overwhelmed. Now, it's important to distinguish the two types of feeling overwhelmed. One is when you're overwhelmed because there's just too much information. It's like drinking from a fire hose. This, you're just taking on too much information. That's one type. The second type happens quite often when you start to learn something. You start to learn to code, for example, and you realize as you go along just how much you don't know and how much there is to know. And suddenly you realize that to achieve your learning goals and objectives, it's going to take a lot more learning than you had originally planned. And that can feel very, very overwhelming. So that's the second type of overwhelm. And I refer to that as an estimation error. You've not estimated correctly how much you're going to have to learn to achieve the goal and the plan you've set out for yourself. So two types. For these two types, typically there are three reasons, a total of three reasons that could explain one or both of these types of overwhelm. So we're going to talk about the types and the reasons for feeling those types of overwhelm in this video. So feeling overwhelmed comes from three reasons, as I've mentioned. One is you've skipped steps and jumped ahead. Two, you've not quite had a specific enough focus resulting in you doing far too much. And three, you've underestimated the size of the goals, specifically how much you're going to have to learn in order to achieve your goal. Now we've covered the first one that is skipping ahead and having jumped too far ahead in the previous video on confusion and the solution and my recommendations are the same. So I'm not going to cover that again here. Just return to that video anytime you need to remind yourself. Let's look at reason number two. What happens when you're feeling overwhelmed from having to absorb way too much information? What could the reason for that be? Well, that feeling is a signal that you're absorbing way more information than you can process, which typically happens because you're trying to do too much. So the solution is to ask yourself, why do I feel like this? And then write down all the pieces that you're simultaneously attacking, all the things that you're simultaneously doing that's making you feel this way. And really ask yourself honestly, why they need to be done simultaneously. Why do I need to do all these things at the same time? Do they really need to be done at the same time? So instead of having them as a giant big list of things to do, just rewrite them as a sequence of steps and make sure, and I cannot emphasize this enough, but make sure that each step in that sequence is the minimum effective dose for the next step. And that all these steps taken together are each 100% necessary, not nice to have, but 100% necessary to achieve your learning objectives. In some senses, 
each step that you're looking at here is the learning objective of the previous step and it telescopes upwards that way. So follow this recipe and break it down. Now I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. Yes, this approach may make you feel like you're extending your time to completion. It's going to take you longer to get there. And that really can feel disappointing and stressful and frustrating. I completely empathize. But also, let me promise you that that is just an appearance. It's going to feel that way, but it's not actually going to be that way. It is going to perhaps take you longer in the short term over the next few days, but it saves you a lot of time in the long term because you're not going to get stuck that often. And you're certainly not going to be so discouraged that you just throw your hands up in the air and say, I'm not doing this, and then you lose a few months. So please, please trust me on this until you see it working for yourself. Follow these suggestions. Do less, which is doing more, and be absolutely clear that each step needs to feed into the very next step after it. So the mindset that you need to have as you go through this process and this training is that feeling overwhelmed is really quite natural and a very normal part of the learning process, especially when you're extending outside your comfort zone, which is always a good, good thing. So the mindset and the feeling of overwhelm, how you relate the two is by recognizing that that feeling of overwhelm is a valuable signal, not something to be afraid of, but a good piece of information. And it's teaching you to manage yourself and to plan better. If you feel like quitting, that's normal too. Just remember that this new mindset you have is meant to prevent you from quitting. So instead of giving up on your goal, just change your approach to one that's better suited to achieving your goal, which is what this entire video is all about. Now let's talk very briefly about question number three, or rather reason number three. If you're feeling overwhelmed because you've suddenly realized that you underestimated how much work you're going to have to do or how much there is to learn, then the main question you need to ask yourself is, do you still want to achieve this goal? So you end up really having to revisit your goals and plans and say, do I really still want this? Am I still committed to achieving this? Look hard at your plans and goals from section one. And if the answer is yes, then adjust your learning goals from section one to reflect the additional steps it's going to take. You've got enough learning and training now to know how to redesign your plan and do it in a way that's sustainable. However, if you decide you don't really want to continue to learn to code, then that is your choice. But if you're thinking this, I would encourage you to not take that decision to not proceed because you're feeling intimidated. If you decide not to proceed, don't let it be because you're giving up, but because you have other better priorities for your time. Okay, so let's recap. The typical reasons why coding is overwhelming falls into two types or categories. One is just the sheer information overload, and the second is the realization that you've underestimated how much learning is required for your specific goals. Both are solvable problems because both are just signals and they're common. They're normal and they can be dealt with very effectively using the tips and techniques I've suggested in this video. Okay, let's move to the next video. Okay, welcome back. In the last video, we learned to accept that feeling overwhelmed is a normal and natural signal and can be a useful signal that actually helps us improve our plan so that we can achieve our learning objectives in a better way. In this video, we are going to talk about something that affects every single person on earth. Doubt. Specifically, self-doubt. We all doubt ourselves. And no matter what we see, the truth is everyone is out there doubting themselves fairly constantly. We are all much better at looking confident than feeling confident. And that's also true of coders. There is a term for this among super high achievers. Many of them report experiencing what is known as imposter syndrome, which is the feeling that they don't really deserve their success and they may be caught out any time now for being frauds. So why am I telling you all this? If big achievers in all walks of life feel doubt and even feel like they may be frauds, then feeling doubt when you're learning a new and difficult skill is totally okay. That's a normal healthy time. It's fine. You're okay. It may feel like you're not fast enough or not talented enough to learn to code. But you're wrong. It just feels that way. 
This is a great time to ask your mentor or model on whether they felt it and how they dealt with it. I guarantee they felt it and have struggled with it. I did too, and all my mentors did too, a lot. I've included the first blog I ever wrote about this as a resource to this video. If you read some other resources in this course, you would have seen this is a recurring theme, this theme of doubt. There is no great trick to beating self-doubt. It boils down to two fairly mechanical things. One, accept this is normal, universal, and perfectly okay. It's an important mindset to have. Then, choose deliberately to ignore it. Your doubts and fears are only the voices in your head. They are not actual facts. The fact is that you cannot do this task in front of you yet. Remember one of the resources I referred to earlier, Carol Dweck's book called Mindset? In that book, she talks about how people sometimes think that they cannot do something, whereas the better way of thinking of it, the more productive and f accurate way of thinking of it is that you cannot do this right now. Thinking that you can never do it is an opinion. Thinking that you can't do it right now is a fact, and it implies you can do it soon. Having that mindset is a growth mindset, and it helps to remind yourself that everything is learnable. It just takes time and effort. The second mechanical step that will be part of your mindset going forward is to simply keep at it. That's it. There's no magic. Just keep at it. We've talked about practice. Revisit that section. Maybe read a little bit more. Let it take a little bit more time. It takes the time it takes. But setbacks to your time plans are something I cover in the next video. So we'll wait for that. For now, just remember that if you can't do it, that is just one snapshot in time. For this moment, you cannot do it. You will eventually be able to do it. Just like at first, you probably sucked at driving or at writing. And now, you can hold a heated debate with someone while driving and you can answer phone calls while writing. It will come to you. Don't worry. Just keep moving forward. Heck, it's not even my advice. It's advice from Rocky. No, nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. So, when you're feeling doubt, don't assume that this is a signal that you're not good enough. Doubt is not really a signal. It's a human condition thing. It is our inner dialogue, and it's usually an opinion, not a fact. Just focus on the facts. You're going to learn to code. That's a fact. Okay, enough motivational speaking. I will see you in the next video. Welcome back. In the last video, we talked about self-doubt and some of the mindsets you need to have to effectively tackle it. How common it is, how universal it is, and how it's not really that much of a problem to deal with, if you know how. Similarly, in this video, we're going to talk about the frustration that comes from coding taking the kind of time it does. Unfortunately, it does take more time than you expect, and that's almost universally the case. In one of the previous videos on myths, we talked about one of the myths being that this is something that you can do really quickly. For example, you may be tempted to believe that you can knock together your next startup in your garage or your dorm room in a weekend. The popular myth around this is unfortunately not true. So the question then is, what is the mindset that you need to deal with the inevitable time it's going to take? And let me say this again, progress is going to be slower than you hoped. That is almost always the way it is. It's just a fact. So knowing that, what sort of mindset do you need to make sure that you're not going to give up? That's what we're going to answer in this video. So knowing that it's a fact that it's going to take more time than you expect or plan doesn't really make it much easier to accept, does it? But it is worth remembering that what we're now dealing with is not really learning anymore. What we need to do is develop a mindset about patience, specifically the patience to work until we achieve our goal. Now, this may sound like the most common sense stuff to you, like, why are you telling me this, Zubin? I know all this. Yes, you do. Everybody does, and yet almost everybody experiences the frustration. It's because there is a gap between what we know and what we believe about ourselves in a situation. So what's really important is to cultivate in yourself the mindset of patience and discipline. And it's not just about coding. The reason we know this open secret 
And the reason we all are aware of this mindset in theory is because it works in every area of life. And in fact, I'd argue it's particularly relevant in coding for someone who's new to the journey of learning how to code. I would actually encourage you to view it as a form of training. See programming as a craft, because that's really what it is. You have to have a craftsman's mindset. You need to apprentice yourself, and all crafts take time to master. It's a slow, deliberate, and steady process. And through it, you will also learn to appreciate that estimating coding tasks is actually hard. You'll learn to do it much, much better with practice, no doubt, but it'll give you a newfound empathy for the idea that you can knock together something very quickly in a few hours. The reason why this mindset of patience and discipline is critical is because there is a real danger that you will run out of patience and give up. And we don't want that, right? Sometimes, in some circumstances, it is okay to decide not to do it. For example, where you're an entrepreneur and you run out of runway, and you only needed to code for the sake of building a certain product. So maybe you ran out of runway, maybe you found a technical co-founder, maybe you found a prototyping tool online that's a more efficient path to achieving your goal. In that case, it sort of makes sense to not code if the coding was only a means to that end. But if you intend to learn to code because you want to be a coder, then losing patience is dangerous because it will cause you to take shortcuts and waste more time and effort, or it'll cause you to give up, in which case you'll never become a coder. So here are some ways for you to overcome the discouragement of slow progress. One, go back to the section on goals and plans and the five W's and refresh yourself on why you want to code. Why did you want to learn to code in the first place? And is that reason something that still resonates? Do you still really, really want it? When you really want something, and the reason why you want something is still very fresh in your mind, you will not give up. That's just how the human mind works. Number two, remind yourself of the simple but inconvenient math of learning something new. Success is equal to time plus effort. There's no getting around it. But it also means that taking longer means more success because it's linked to time. You know, I personally struggled with this situation and this mindset so many times. I mean, progress for me was so slow. I ran out of runway, I ran out of patience, and then I ran out of confidence. At one time, I had more money than I had time, and at another time, I had more time than I had money, and each time, I adjusted my plan to suit my specific circumstances. That's actually how I discovered the concept of the minimum effective dose to get the outcome I considered adequate given my limited resources. And then, I guess my life changed a little bit when I read a certain letter that Tim Ferriss included in his book, Tools of Titans. I've provided a link in the resources section to this video. This letter summarized the whole issue of slow progress brilliantly. It's a letter from a coach to Tim Ferriss. And I've included an excerpt of this letter in the course resources. But you know what? I recommend getting the book. It's worth it even just for that one letter. Definitely read it. In fact, the first word of that letter sums up the mindset you need. I'm not going to tell you what it is because you've got to go and find it yourself. Okay, that's enough for now. I'll see you in the next video. Hey, welcome back. In the last video, we talked about how slow progress can be. We saw that slow progress is an inevitable part of learning complex skills. Initially, it takes ages. We seem completely incompetent. In fact, there is a well-known framework for understanding the stages that every human being has to go through as they travel from being a newbie to being a master. Here it is. And unfortunately, I don't have a source for the drawing other than the Reddit link I found it at. It's a fantastic drawing and it sums it up beautifully. I've added the Reddit link in the resources section to this video. As you can see, moving from step two to step three is the hardest. It's really hard. And it's that trough of despair that overcomes a lot of people. So in this video, we're going to talk about getting stuck. Why? Because that happens a lot in coding and you need the right strategies and mentality around it. Let me assure you, this happens to senior experienced programmers too. I've added another resource to this video, which is a Quora post on getting stuck in programming. 
just for example's sake. It's normal and common. It happens at all levels. You just get better at dealing with it, mainly through better strategies that come from your experience. Personally, the first few months I got stuck a lot. I mean, let's be honest, console errors look like a mess. They are absolutely bizarre looking and are definitely not beginner friendly. It's just this crazy jumble of text and weird words and numbers. It makes no sense. And debugging really does feel frustrating and mysterious. So I got stuck and stuck and stuck and stuck. It made me so angry because often I was following somebody else's tutorials and then things had changed in some library or package or the, the operating system or something. And so the tutorial is no longer up to date and people are writing new tutorials, but I'm stuck in the old one, don't know about the new one. And so my project's pretty much wasted, or at least it feels like that to me. So my suggestion is this, when, when an error happens, the first thing to tell yourself is, okay, this is now going to take me some time. Accept it. I don't know how much time, so best not to be in a hurry, I guess. Maybe better not to expect to resolve it today. It would be great if I could, but it's very possible this may take a few days. Next, ask yourself, can I make any sense of this error message? Look for any clue that you can Google about. And then you Google the errors and keep searching till you find someone that has handled something similar. Sometimes it could be a small error or bug in your code and you need to step away and then you'll see it. The point is you step away and then you slowly build up the skill of troubleshooting your errors and Google and Stack Overflow are your friends. But it does take a lot of patience and effort to read through all the results carefully and to understand where this error is coming from. That also takes experience. Sometimes people use terms and words interchangeably and that can cause a lot of confusion for you. So just keep patient. This is part of the learning process. And remember, pace yourself. We've talked about this. Pace yourself so you can be sustainable. Unfortunately, as we talked about in the last video, it's going to take the time it takes. And as you experience these sort of frustrations and getting stuck more often, you do get faster at diagnosing and resolving the issues. But if you rush too much on a new error, then you run the risk of making mistakes that'll cost you even more time. But I find, and I'm sure this is a consolation to you, that the first time I try anything, I rarely get it right. I make mistakes and come up against obstacles I hadn't planned on. The second time, well, that's a different story. The second time is usually a a lot faster. It takes me typically about one third the time of the previous time. And that's true of diagnosing and solving errors too. So the mindset to have here is not to blame yourself, but recognize this getting stuck issue as a necessary and unavoidable part of coding and an important part of your learning experience. Also remember that the first few times are the worst. Like anything else, the first few times are the worst. It's going to be slow and frustrating needs a lot of patience and focus on not rushing yourself. Things are going to break. Things are going to make no sense sometime. You're going to get stuck in a hole and you're not going to know how to get out of it for a few hours. That's just how it is and it's okay. Sometimes you've chased the wrong angle and you need to rewrite an entire chunk of code. I've had to do that several times. Even recently, I thought I'd researched a library pretty well and used it in a small project. Five days later, I found out that the library does not actually do something the exact way I needed it to. I had designed my app the wrong way, it was my fault, and I could either rewrite my code to fit this library, or start researching again to find another library, or write my own code from scratch instead of using that library. All these options were going to take me time. And I found that out after being stuck for a few days, so I'd already lost time. I had made the mistake of rushing. Another two hours of reading on the library would have given me the information I needed to design my app right from the start and saved me potentially over eight days. So getting stuck is normal. It's part of the experience. Don't rush yourself. Don't let despair overcome your desire to be creative through code. This is one of the less fun parts of being a developer. There is no doubt. So just focus on the fun parts to keep your motivation up. And to conclude, let me show you something else from one Quora user. Reading it definitely made me feel better. So don't worry about getting stuck, just keep moving forward. And now let's move forward to the next video. Welcome back. In the last video, we talked about getting stuck a lot and how that's 
fairly normal, but also there are very good mindsets and techniques to deal with that problem. In this video, we're going to talk about another very common source of setbacks for coders, which is making unfavorable comparisons. As humans, we tend to compare ourselves with others. That's normal. But it's almost always unfavorable and unhelpful because it has a particularly negative effect when it impacts your confidence as well. I know quite a few people who think that coding is what they show in the movies or on TV. Nope, it's not. Equally, don't assume that you can build the same sort of application that Google can. After all, they have thousands of developers working on every small line of code. When you feel this way and find that you're making these sort of demoralizing comparisons, speak to an experienced mentor or model or someone who's done what you're trying to do. They will give you a perspective that is closer to reality. And look, if you're going to compare yourself, then do it in these two ways. One, if they can do it, I can too. Two, if they could do it in 1976 or in 1996, when the world didn't even have the kind of resources we now have, and there was no Google and no Stack Overflow, then it's much easier for me to do it now. Or rather, it was much harder for them, and I've got it easy compared to them. So even if you secretly think you're not as smart as they are, fine. I don't agree, but fine. You don't need to be. You can do what they can do, because you've actually got it easier. Just remember that Bill Gates and Steve Wozniak and Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey are a bunch of self-taught folks who taught themselves in a world where resources were significantly harder to access than they are today. So if they can do it with those constraints, you can absolutely do it with all the material freely available on your fingertips today. The mindset to have here is that it's never been easier to become a coder and it's easier for me to do it than it was for them. Okay, let's move to the next video. Okay, welcome back everybody. In this video, we now conclude the section on the setbacks and the corresponding mindsets that'll help you overcome those setbacks. This section is one of the most important in the entire course because this is the section that I think you will keep coming back to over the months and years that you try to teach yourself to code because it's the one that's going to help you overcome a lot of those obstacles and you're going to remember a lot of the things I say here when you encounter those obstacles. It's not hard to learn to code, but it is a difficult task to persist in learning to code. So this section is so important, so fundamental to your success in learning to code that I'm going to spend this conclusion video just wrapping up and recapping all the key messages from each of the videos in this section so that you also have it in the one place. Let's keep going. So the key ideas in this section are the following. One, learning to code is very confusing. Well, everything you read is going to feel confusing at first. The mindset you need to have is, it's okay, it's normal. It's just a signal that maybe you've skipped ahead too far and you need to wind back just a little bit. Reverse out of the situation, back out slowly, and then break your next step up into smaller pieces, into smaller next steps. Go for the quick wins so your confidence stays up and you have a strong sense of your own progress. Idea two, you're feeling overwhelmed. Yep, that's fairly common and normal too, and it's usually two types of being overwhelmed. One is from too much information, and the other is from finding out that you may have underestimated how much you need to do. Both apply very commonly to learning complex skills. That's always a hard thing to do, but you know, it's very rewarding when you persist. Feeling overwhelmed is a useful signal as well. It tells you that maybe you're biting off more than you can chew mentally. So again, break it down. Smaller pieces make it easier to digest. Often, we're just trying to pile our priorities one on top of the other. Instead, stop, step back, separate your priorities so that they're steps along a path and not one big jumbled pile. Test each step to make sure it's 100% necessary to achieve your goals. 
make sure that without taking that step, you cannot achieve your goal. Number three, you're feeling a lot of self-doubt. This is totally normal and universal. It's a human thing. It just proves you're human. That's good, right? Remind yourself that it is not that you cannot do something. It's that you cannot do something as yet. This is the sign of a growth mindset. Next, remind yourself that the only way to do it is by doing it over and over again. Just keep going. It will click into place in time, guaranteed. And if you need extra inspiration, remember Rocky. It ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Number four, progress is so slow. Yes, it is. Progress is always slow for new skills. Progress demands that you have patience and persistence. For extra help, go back to your five W's and remind yourself of your why. Why are you doing this? The danger is not that you can't do it, it's that you will lose patience and quit. If your why is important enough, you won't quit. It's that simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. And think of it as math. Success is always equal to effort plus time. And since time is half the equation, the more time you spend, the more progress you're going to make. For super inspiration, read that letter from Coach Sommer to Tim Ferriss included in the book Tools of Titans. Number five, getting stuck a lot. Yep, that's normal. It's part of the experience of programming at all levels of experience. You deal with it first by reminding yourself that maybe this is going to take a little more time than you had planned. That's okay. Got to accept it. Then slowly start investigating the problem and unravel it piece by piece. It is not possible to learn to code without having to start over on some things. That is just a normal part of coding. So don't fight it and it will be easier to deal with. But the first few times are always, always very hard and always takes you a lot more time. But every time you do it, you get faster and you get better. Number six, comparing yourself to others. For example, I'm not like Zuck. If you do compare yourself, then do it in a way that favors you. For example, if Zuck can do it, you absolutely can. And if Steve Jobs and Wozniak and Bill Gates could do it without any of the resources you have today conveniently at your fingertips, then recognize it is much harder for them, which means you can absolutely do it. Okay, I think you've got some formidable tools and mindsets and weapons here in your arsenal to pursue your dream to code. Let's wrap this up so that we can get you started on your journey as soon as possible. I'll see you in the next video. Congratulations, guys. You've made it to the end. I am so incredibly excited for you and proud of you and what we've done together. This is fantastic. Look, you've got your training shoes on. You are so ready. You are so ready for the marathon of learning to code. And I would argue you're actually ready to learn pretty much any new skill that you want. It just happens to be about coding for this course, right? I hope you enjoyed yourself as much as I did uh, sharing with you all the, the, the stuff that I've learned over the years. And if you're still here till this very end point, um, that means you've got the, the ability to persist. And you know what I say, the only thing that stands between you and your goal is time and effort and lots of practice. But if you've made it this far, then that means you're willing to put in the work, which is fantastic. Hopefully, through the help of this course, you've now got tools and frameworks that will help you reduce the amount of time and effort required to achieve your learning objectives. But there's no getting around the fact that time and effort is what it's going to take. So I have no doubt that you're going to get there. And I'm really excited that you've come to the end. A couple of things, just um, sort of housekeeping towards the end. One, if you could keep contributing to the Q&A as you go through your learning journey, that would be most valuable to all of us. Selfishly, I would love to hear how this course has helped and how you've personally experienced some of the things I've talked about in this course. But also, I think the rest of the student community would get a lot from knowing that other students, their peers, could be like models and mentors to them in showing them their personal application of some of the lessons from this uh, course. So if you do have some stuff like that to share, please, please, please share it on 
on the Q&A and also reach out to me on Twitter and, and share it on Twitter because that's another great way to show the world that you've made such good progress, that you've got the initiative and the drive to do what you're doing. So definitely share it on the Q&A and on Twitter. Finally, I think it's safe to say that now's a really good time for you to pause and savor the moment, like celebrate because you've taken an enormous leap forward in your demonstration of your willingness to do what it takes, do whatever it takes to win and to achieve your learning objective. Like I said, no doubt that you're going to make it, you're going to nail it. Keep going, don't stop. And if there's anything you need, I'm right here. All right, good luck.